Welcome to Hoodstocks, buddy. Sheesh. Got a banger for you right here. Mm. Let's go. Like, subscribe, all that good shit. Y'all already know. Goalie, stand up. In the building, buddy. Shout to Chop City, man. Beast Bang, tap in with the homie Chop City on Instagram. <clears throat> man, man oh man. Sheesh. Stepping up the game around here. Stepping up the game today. Speaking of stepping up the game, today's guest. Today's guest, we got a government trained gangster. <laughs> That's right, brother. That's right. We got a government trained gangster, man. And you know what? This is dope because usually we got, you know, we got the street gangsters right here. It's different level. Different level today, man. Uh, let's go down the list. Marine. Eh, Navy SEAL. Check. <laughs> Blackwater mercenary. Check, check, check. check. You know what I mean? Used to be a bodyguard for Whitney Houston. Check, 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 check. I'm just saying. We're the Houston, really. I, just, I gotta check that. <laughs> I gotta Google that. I'm just fucking around, bro. Uh, at one point, FBI fugitive. Damn. Check. Okay. In a nutshell, just a bad. Mm. Okay. Right. I want everybody to raise up off your futons, man, and give it up for Jimmy Watson, baby. Thank you very much, brother. It's an honor, man. It's an honor. Thank you so much. No, absolutely, brother. It's an honor to have you on in the sense of we've had a lot of uh, we've had a lot of ex-military. We've had a lot of veterans. And first off, thank you for your service. Thank you, brother. It's it's an honor, like I said, to be on here. Yeah. yeah. And so we've had a lot of veterans, but we've never had the caliber of individual like yourself, bro. Thank you, bro. This is crazy. Thank you. This is legendary. Excited, man. I'm excited, bro. I'm excited, man. Um, shoot, where do we start? Where do we start, man? You've been through a lot in your life. Wow. You've been a lot in your, I mean, Navy SEAL, man, Blackwater, John uh, McAfee, right? A road to redemption, man. You know, a lot of, a lot of trials and tribulations uh, that I think um, most men or women can that most men or women can can relate to. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, but a lot of ups and downs, a lot of valleys, some peaks, you know, the highs and lows, um, that proverbial prison mm. that um, we all can find ourselves in, and then that, that real brick and mortar physical prison, not for the, not near the time or anything like that that some hardcore gangsters do, like yourself and others. Um, but steal the feds, steal house arrest for a year and a half. Um, but really, it's a story of redemption. And usually I say that at the end of my story, but I really want your listeners out there, instead of moving on to the next show or podcast, to really, you know, uh, give me a chance here uh, to tell my story. And maybe, and I know they'll be able to relate and to absolutely get something out of this. Road to Redemption, baby. That's what we do right here at Hoodstocks, man. Yeah. You know, it's it's so crazy because usually, like we talked about previously, man, you know, it's mostly, bro, we have dudes come on here that are, you know, I mean, they're killers, but they're street killers. You know what I mean? It's a different type of, it's a different type of uh, violence, right? War is war, yeah. And these dudes, uh, some of these dudes served 25, 30 years, and now they're out. I mean, Gavin Newsom, Gascon, some people that aren't very, they're not very favored 
within the state of California or the city of Los Angeles. But I will say that some of these dudes have gotten a second chance. Because, you know, crimes committed at 16, 17 years old, you know, mm. took somebody's life, served 25, 30 years. Mm. I mean, you're not the same person you were when you're 16, 17 years old, right? Hell no. Hell yeah, no. Hell you know what I mean? No. So these dudes des deserve, right? And a lot of these dudes we have on, bro, they're, they're, they're the sweetest dudes now, in a sense. Of course. You know? And, and they're, they've got a plethora of knowledge, and and now they're in this these communities, and they're paying it forward. Yep. And so, but to have a man of your stature and what you've been through is, a, once again, it's a total honor. And um, I, I usually, I'm, I might have a little hard time navigating with you because I know the street stuff. Now, you a gangster on a whole nother level, right? Um, so I'm just gonna, I did a little bit of homework and um, I'm gonna do my best at this. I wanna start off like this, and it's a it might be a little, a couple little questions before we get into your story. All right, let's go, yeah. Okay. I'm ready. Who would, who would win in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, hand-to-hand -hand combat fight between you and Sean Ryan? Oh, me for sure. Come on, bro. <laughs> Come on, man. Nah, I like, I love Sean Ryan. I think everybody, I don't think nobody has a problem with Sean, Sean Ryan, so I hope it never comes to that, you know? It's a silly. Have you ever been on his podcast, his show? I have never been on his show. And Sean Ryan, what is going on with that, you know? And yeah. we, we're going to clip this, and I, hopefully he sees this. Let's well. clip this, man, because I'm ready. I've had, a, I've had a lot of people say, hey, man, what's up with you and Sean Ryan? Let's go, you know? And, hey, but you know what? It's wherever, wherever God takes me, man, that's where I go now. I go with the flow, and that's how you stay in that flow state, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, when the, when, when, when the, when the stars align, they align, baby. That's right. You know, man. when it's time, it's yeah. time. And it's I think your time is coming. It's only making sense because you're making a lot of noise with your story and what you've been through all over the internet. Um, but I, I would say sometimes too, there's a little bit of a politics within you guys. Oh yeah, there's politics, oh, right? There's time. differences. Oh yeah, there's something that he might have seen or that or heard from you that he didn't agree with, and it's like, nah, I'm not gonna have him on my podcast because that's how it is with us between the street dudes, you know? Bro, it's 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 epically like that. I wish it wasn't like that in the seals, but. Um, you know, you know, in the teams, we say teams and shit. An explosion goes off near you, boom, teams and shit. You get punched at a bar, teams and shit. You're always saying teams. It's all about the teams. You know, it's all about a team, a tribe, a warrior, a warrior group, right? Being part of a brotherhood. And I'll tell you what, in the SEALs, unfortunately, uh, when you get out, there's a lot of politics to be played, a lot of catty business, you know? Yeah. Um, one guy, I, I think one guy even reached out to Sean Ryan at some point and he even said that, you know, he he wasn't sure about me because of my, my leadership style and ability, you know? And uh, uh, because because of the whole Nisar Square, Baghdad's Bloody Sunday, you know, where all these guys got hemmed up and put in prison and, and, uh, and pardoned by Trump. And, and so Sean Ryan, man... Um, you know, I would love to go on a show, like I said, but he's had a lot of SEALs, and the, the SEAL teams, man, are are pretty, they can be kind of catty and clickish, you yeah. know, and you're kind of, you're in this group or you're in that group, but I try to I try to get along with everybody. I have a lot of awesome friends in the teams and in and, and Green Berets and uh, Marsock and on the Special Force. Man, I love everybody now, bro. You try you know to mix it up a little bit. I try rub, to mix it up, man. Yeah, rub shoulders and shit. Be like I, I, yeah, but but also, man, I, I, I'm all about... You know, not being fake, no matter what. No matter what, bro. Because, you know, like people are like, what, what's that scar on your neck, bro? You get shot. And I'm like, yeah, man, I got hit by an RPG, homie. And they're like, nah, come on. And I'm like, no, dude, it's a tattoo I had removed, burned off. You know? <laughs> my, girl, my, my girl's uh, lips on my, on my neck, you know. But it's important to be super real with people, right? Yeah. After I got it burned off, it looked like Dracula kissed me, man. For like <laughs> two weeks, bro. It was terrible. Bro. Well, it really left you a scar. Yeah. I, I've, laser, okay. I've lasered about... You see all that shit, bro? Yeah. I've lasered, like, my head, everything, neck, everything, bro. Dang, man. Yeah, I can see, man. It's crazy. Dude. And then I put tattoos back on top <laughs> yeah, of it. <laughs> That's what we do, yeah. Yeah. Um, here's another silly question, but I think it's interesting, though, too, at the same time. If there was five Navy SEALs against 20 street dudes, what would be the outcome of that? Five SEALs against, like, how, how who are we talking about street dudes? Like, real Gs on the street, like, hardcore dudes? Yeah, against five, five seals. Probably, probably get probably five five seals would get beat up. Huh? Probably. 
Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, man, at the end of the day, man, we're we're just human beings, bro. We put on our pants like everybody else, and and a lot of people probably maybe think that the seals are are. Um, I, I mean, I I know a seal that actually like punched Chuck Liddell in the face. I mean, there was a couple witnesses and knocked Chuck Liddell out. Now that's what the witnesses says. I wasn't there. They got yeah. arrested for it, but and that was at a bar. But then again, you have you know UFC fighters that can beat the shit out of. Uh, anybody seals yeah. anybody right yeah you know anybody sean strickland be talking a lot of I, shit man on. sean strickland is talking trash all the time and all i see with him man is like a little insecure boy inside you know what i mean but he's hard as nails in his game but the problem with that is is like like check it out check it out if i refused to go on a mission in the seals if i refuse to go on a mission I would be called the biggest pussy in the community ever, ever. Absolutely. And then you probably would get kicked out. So um, you can't be that hard, Sean Strickland, can't be that hard if he's refusing to fight his own guys on his own level. But instead, he's kind of become what he hates so much is the top, you know, ultimate fighting influencer champion of the world, you know. And so until he starts to take a fight anytime, anywhere with his own level – which, by the way, is right there in his own backyard. He's always telling guys to come over to his gym and fight him. Well, the UFC is right there next to next to him saying, come on over and fight in the UFC. So I have no qualms, no personal problems, man, in, you know, with Sean Strickland. He helped pay my rent for a while there, you know, with some of them videos. But, you know, people are like, he's in your head. He's, he's, he's you know, living rent-free in your head. I was like, nah, dog, he's uh, paying my rent, homie. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Sorry, bro. So you guys have actually had interaction with each other. Never, never. He's never, he never addressed me personally. Okay. He kind of alluded like Navy SEAL influencer, steroided out dude on, on, on IG, Instagram. Okay. I'm like, I think that's me, man. Yeah. I think that's me. I think he's talking about me. <laughs> I don't know, though. I How think, about when he went after, what's his name, uh, homeboy that fucking running and gunning and all that shit? Goggins? On? Yeah, Goggins, bro. Le what the leave fuck? Goggins alone. Yeah, man, what the fuck, know? bro? It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like Jake Paul going after... Tyson, you know? I hate that, bro. Ty I'm yeah. not a fan of that, bro. Yeah, because Ty Tyson's a legend, you know? And it's like, leave him alone, man. You're just trying to get clicks and stuff. You're just trying to get um, views and stuff. And, and man, I, I don't want to ever take away from Sean Strickland's hardcoreness, you know? But he ought to leave. He should have left the Seals alone because he lost a ton, a ton of respect. I mean, a ton across the board with veterans um, by doing by doing those shenanigans. You know, I agree, bro. I, I feel like he's being disrespectful, bro. Super and he's, disrespectful, and he's, and he's barking up the wrong motherfucking tree, man. Yeah. You know, and these these dudes right here have sacrificed their lives, individuals like yourself, for our country, yeah. right? For us, for the ones that you know, for the strong Sean Stricklands that kept you being able to train in the gyms and yeah, and, live, and live your happy life in the U.S. You know, like brother, I just I have honestly, man, I wish. When I was 18 years old, instead of going to prison, the penitentiary, I wish I had an option to join like the Marines or something like that. Yeah, man. You know, what do you think? What do you think about this? This is kind of, I know we're kind of just like shooting from the hip yeah, right good now. Yeah, it's good though. I like it. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about this? What do you think if um, LA, we'll talk about LA, right? Instead of them shooting these 18 year olds, bro, to uh, prison, what if they just said, hey, man, we're going to send you to the, you know, to fight for the country, you know? Would you think that would, would do you think that would, would that be a good thing, a bad thing? Bro, 100% good thing, man. Yeah. I mean, instead of doing that, though, what they're actually doing is allowing girls to come into the Green Berets now. You know? They're allowing... And, the, and like, there was a guy, a sergeant, who was in Fallujah fighting door-to-door, -door, like, hand-to-hand -hand combat, basically. Uh, he went to re-enlist, and he had a tattoo on his forearm that he got... And they kicked him out. They wouldn't let him re-enlist. They didn't kick him out, but they wouldn't let this sergeant re-enlist. This dude was fighting hand-to-hand -hand in Fallujah, and the Marines are kicking dudes out for tattoos. I don't know what it's like now, but yeah. that's how it was. Can you imagine that? Like, they punish guys for being hardcore warriors and being free, and they allow this whole um, females in the ranks. In male units, it's it's insane, bro. So you don't you don't for one thing, check it out, man. Let a motherfucker put his war paint on, even if it's a let, fucking let him, tattoo. Let him go, man. Let, let him be a bad motherfucker. Let the sled dogs run, you know. Hundred percent. 
So women get into these men, the ranks of men, like the Green Berets you said, you mentioned? Yeah, there's a couple women that are Green Berets. And and so why you do know? you disagree with that happening? Like, what is it doing to that system? How is it affecting it? Not an, Obviously, you're saying it's not affecting it in a positive way, it's a negative way. I mean, are they can't carry their weight? Bro, you lower the standards to raise the average, and you are going to lose every single time. That's what they did with Blackwater. They started hiring cops uh, to, to go be warfighters. They started cowering out like pussies, and then, you know, you start losing – and getting guys killed. Um, they did a massive study already, a co-ed study where they put females in all male marine units in 29 palms. We call it with 29 stumps, 29 palms. And they did this massive stuff, uh, um, a test. After all the data was collected, they realized that the females that were in this co-ed combat unit with the men were injured all the time. They couldn't get the heavy weapons online. They couldn't get over obstacles quick enough. They couldn't buddy carry, and they were 25% less combat effective. If we're willing as America to take those odds, be 25% less combat effective, mm. are you kidding me, bro? Yeah. World War Three happens. We're we screwed, bro. Yeah. You know? 100%. And that's not bagging on women. I, I've said this on another podcast. There was a female A-10 war, Warthog pilot that was brilliant, and she saved an entire SEAL team from an encroaching Taliban unit. But she was up there. Exactly. If she was down here, she, she compromises the team. Be a liability. Just like I can't get in an A-10 Warthog right now. Yeah. It's not my, it's not my field. Hundred percent. I agree with you on that. I agree with you on that. But the, the, this the, the climate that we live in, though, man, they just really want to just like, you know, uh, from the Me Too movement to just equal rights and all this other not equal rights because everyone has equal rights, but our equal opportunity, sure. right? Yeah. Equal opportunity is the word I'm looking for. Um, I feel it. I hear it. Some you know some people saying? don't want to hear that though, bro. People don't want to hear this stuff, man. No. And, and maybe, but, but everybody's thinking it. Everybody's thinking of it. And, and you know, have I been wrong many times, bro? Yeah. You know, you know, it's like it's like you see a picture of yourself ten years ago, and you're like, "What the hell was I wearing? Like, <laughs> like what's up with my haircut, man? You know, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna look ten years from now, going, "Oh my god, I can't believe I had that hair." But with that V-neck too, and with that crazy V-neck, man, what's <laughs> up, dog? Look at these tats, and, and, you know, feeling yourself, you're feeling yourself, baby. I don't care, man. Whatever, dude. Yeah, uh, good. And uh, but I don't even know where we were going with that. But you know what I'm saying. Well, um, in hindsight, but times change. you're talking about in hindsight of looking back and saying, fuck, what the fuck were we doing? Yeah, yeah, all the time, bro. People people change, and um, and my thoughts have changed, my views. I, I I was brainwashed and went into and when we went into Baghdad, Iraq. I thought, and everybody else did too. You remember, man, it was like 99% approval to go into Baghdad, Iraq, dude. Everybody was down because we were we were hopped up off the, the 9-11 stuff. And so we were like, let's go into Iraq now. They, fuck some shit they up. They got nuclear weapons on me, and and guess what? Nothing. They didn't have no nuclear weapons. No, nothing. Let, let me ask you we, this. Go ahead. Uh, like what? A million? Probably a million casualties. Uh, probably a million casualties. Don't quote me on that, but it's insane, man. When I was in James Haley Veterans Hospital, war is no match. For a million casualties on our side or their side, bro? I think total yeah. casualties. Total casualties. I, 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 I think that was the number I've seen. It's it's a ton, bro. Let me ask you this, bro. So when 9-11 happened, man, I remember when 9-11 happened. Um, I'm sure a lot of us do. Very, very, whew, man, just watching the news, and you know, and you were watching it on a phone, a whole nether lens, right? Uh, boots to ground type of shit. Um, a lot of people were talking about conspiracy theories. The government did that to ourselves. I mean, how do you feel when you hear the, the stuff like that? Bro, it pisses me off, man. Okay. Because, because let's face it, and, and I, I'm going to get some heat for this because it's popular opinion to say the government did it. Now, I don't disagree with that. Indirectly, I think the government had a lot to do with the Twin Towers falling down. Directly, CIA agents flying the freaking airplanes and putting explosives in there, you know, and I agree the towers fell down real weird. I saw this documentary. But at the end of the day, you have to look at it logically and say, Okay, um, who the hell flew those airplanes into those buildings? Because airplanes hit those buildings, um, and yeah, the buildings melted really strangely and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, 
the freaking airplanes hit the buildings. And I believe that it was it was absolutely Osama bin Laden. Or maybe I have to believe that to sleep at night because I went to Afghanistan and Iraq. I was in two different wars, you know. During that or right after that? Bro, I was the first Marine unit. We were the first Marines. I was in first Marines, and we were the first Marines in um, Camp Rhino and uh, even in Pakistan before, um, as Bush was saying, we're still trying to figure this out. So um, I was actually overseas on the USS Peleliu, already deployed. So we were the first forward unit in the Marine Corps. Wow. And so when we heard, so we had just stopped off at Australia. So when we heard, so when we heard um, that the planes hit the towers, the shore police were running up and down the streets in, in Perth, Australia, rounding us up, the sailors. They were rounding all the Marines up, and we were drunk, and they were, like, literally beating us to get us back on the ship. And when they got us back on the ship, an old gunny got up there, and the gunny was crying and said, hey, you guys, you better get ready. We're going to war. It's going to be war, war three. And we were, like, so excited, so ready. We were so mad, so fierce. We trained so hard, and they un we unleashed – we. They unleashed the the lockers down on the ship and brought out just thousands and thousands of like rounds and grenades and, and AT4 rockets and, and all this stuff these ships are carrying all the time. And we loaded down, bro, and we got on these um, super stallion uh, birds, you know, helos on the ship deck and left at 3 a.m. in the morning. And we're, I was probably maybe the seventh guy on the ground out of the helicopter in Afghanistan. It wasn't that sexy, but I mean, it was cool. You know? <laughs> this shit sounds sexy as fuck. Yeah. Damn, that's that's what we do. Bro. That's why I'm wearing this shirt right now. Yes, yeah, sir. Bro, wow. Motherfuckers dream about that shit sometimes. I mean, some dudes do, or some, but if you don't dream about it, you see it in the movies. Dude, man. Every, every man's gotta fight a battle. And like you were talking about these young, these young dudes on the streets and stuff and and instead of sending them to prison they need to send them to marine boot camp or something i mean like a french foreign legion type deal for the yeah. for the I mean, why not bro yeah. get their act together yeah straighten up i mean because there's some years you got to kill off as a kid like from i say from from 15 years old i i mean i got out of school when i was 14 and from i was wild they couldn't keep me in school i had the record for detention and swats in texas i was a <laughs> terrible kid and they my parents yanked me out of school when i was 14 and if i didn't have the marines at 17 years old and kill off a bunch of years you know the in the 20s i'd be probably dead man i was wild you know growing up in uh what part of texas you grew up in west texas I heard you talking about another interview. It was just basically like in the middle of nowhere. Bro, in the middle of nowhere. Mule Shoe, Texas. Like a mule and a shoe. <laughs> and I was raised on an old farm in the middle of a, 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 a free a, a, a feedlot on one side and a dairy on the other. So it smelled like shit yeah. really bad. But I loved it out there, man. I loved it. I loved playing out there. I dreamed of going to war. And... Uh, you know, one of the three core desires of a man is is to fight some type of battle. Yeah. And so we find ourselves fighting all these wrong battles in life because you're going to be fighting a battle in your life. At any given time, you can think right now, your listeners can think right now and think, what battle are you fighting right now? And it doesn't have to be a kinetic war like I went to. There's all kinds of battles. It could be on Wall Street. It could be uh, on the streets. It could be selling this, selling that, whatever it is, but you're going to be fighting some type of battle because that's what, and we're meant to go on an adventure. And when we're fighting the wrong battle and then we're not going on that adventure, we get in trouble. I feel like I was, uh, I feel like me and you were similar kids, but just raised in different settings, right? Yep. Different landscapes. Um, but I wanted to go on an adventure, you know? Yep. And I, oh God, man, if, if, if I maybe had the, maybe the right influences or, you know, um, I would have went to, I would have served for the country, you know what I mean? Because that would have been an amazing adventure. You yeah, know? Absolutely. But man. instead, some of us guys in the inner city on the streets, um, which obviously is a whole different lifestyle than how you were raised, but 
it's still the same individuals so though from you know what I mean the way they made young dudes yeah, yeah. want to have fun you know rowdy wild, motherfuckers yeah. wild bro right um we a lot of us guys in the city and you know there's one of the gang infested spots we go on we still go on adventure but we ended up going to prison like I wanted to go to prison like you when you were young bro you said I'm going to be a seal right yeah. you said I'm going to I'm going to go I'm going to serve the country well when I was young I said I, I want to go to prison Damn, I wanted dude. to go to prison bro that's intense man I wanted to go to prison because that's where you get you know, that's where you, you kind of like battle tested. That's where you, you mm -hmm. know, um, and I've been in a lot of riots, a lot of weird shit, crazy shit. You know what I mean? Hand to hand combats in, the, you know, in a cell, you know what I mean? With another dude, you know what I mean? Like, in the, you know, and it doesn't compare to what you've done and what you've been through. Because to me, that I don't is, know, that, man, that, that's that, pretty crazy, bro. That, that is the ultimate, like, you know, uh, upper echelon of just fucking just warrior fucking shit. Soldier, man, just. Fucking, and I think I think that's why it does so well on podcasts. The the the, uh, the prison stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's an allure. It's like attractive to me. It's like, dude, I I, I want to be like those dudes. I want to be hard like that. I can remember I, all I wanted to be was a seal, but I knew I didn't have what it took to be a seal uh, from the time I was small. I had that lion's heart, but I didn't have the body. Wasn't picking up what the other kids were picking up. Yeah, what the teacher was putting down. You know, and so I had ADHD. And I was frustrated. I was so mad because I couldn't learn anything like the other kids. And so I just took my frustrations out on on either fighting or um, or just distracted in school. Didn't want to go to school. Started steal, stealing stuff, cigarettes, all this stuff. You know, when I was a kid. Yeah. And so yeah, man, it was it was it was wild, bro. But but I know um, I when I seen. When I seen these seals one time, they looked like prisoners. Some of them, they, they were all tatted up and jacked, and they were behind this chain link fence. Yeah. And they were doing these pull ups. This guy was doing these these wide grip pull ups, bro. He had <laughs> all this crazy blonde hair sticking out, and I mean, I just idolized that, bro. Yeah, I would I would I would do anything to be like that. Yeah, you're like that's badass. And, I need yeah, to be one exactly. of them bad motherfuckers. And you know how you visualize and, and you and you want to do something so bad, and then you find yourself doing it. Yeah, and it may not be what you thought it was, but you there, you know? Yeah, I, I I remember sitting in church with my mom, like when I was young, young, and I, I don't know what they were talking about. I don't know what the, you know, what the minister was talking about, but I was always like, mom, the way I was wired as a kid is I was like, man, if somebody came in right now <laughs> and they try to get the minister and they try to guns come out, oh man, I would do this, that, and I'm gonna save the day. Well, you know, this is, you know, uh, I'm talking back about, you know, how we, how we think as a young adolescent, you know, want to go on the adventure, want to be wild. But I ended up going on all those adventures, the high speed pursuits, bro. You know what I mean? Running and gunning on the street with the gun, fighting with police officers. You know what I mean? I, I, I Man, Dang, I, once again, I wish I would have saved that energy. You know, and then people, some people, you know, you got these cats that talk about, oh, you know what I mean? Why would you want to fight for this country? You know, the same way I, reason why I would like to live in this country. You know what I mean? All oh, this, that, you know, everyone's got some negative shit to say while they're fucking microwaving their hot pocket, living a great life. Bro, you know? I can't say it. Yeah, because because people got it all mixed up. Like when Sean Strickland was like, oh, you're fight, Go back to Afghanistan, Goggins, and, and this, this crazy stuff about war. See, what he doesn't understand is that it's not about Freedom isn't about right and wrong. It's about violent MFers, man, out there standing by, ready to do boot on neck policy for the bidding of America to keep the women and children safe. Yeah. Our kids and women. It's not about right or wrong in Afghanistan. Yeah. It ain't about right or wrong in Baghdad. It's about you have a brutal, violent force of men standing by that are willing to kill your ass. At a, at a drop of a dime, and that's what it's all about. So Sean Strickland's got got messed up thinking there. He's like, oh, you know, you, you know, you go 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 over there with all the the sand guys in Afghanistan. He has no idea what it's all about. We ain't going over there for the, you know, for anything else but our boys, our swim buddies, our you know, to the left and right, and then our families at home. Hundred percent. Because if you have that presence, as long as you have that presence. Yeah. Going over uh, America's ability to go to Baghdad uh, or go to Afghanistan for 20 freaking years, that's a long haul. If you have that persona about you, like when you walk in the room, it's all about uh, perception. Like, hey, I, I ain't going to mess with Lucky, man. Look at him. He's got tattoos everywhere. 
Yeah. He's like looking at me with those crazy eyes, talking about prison and stuff. I'm like, <laughs> all right, you know, I ain't gonna mess with Lucky. Yeah. Well, people ain't gonna mess with America if you got the dudes with the crazy eyes. Yeah, you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> That's what it comes down to, bro. Yes, sir. Yeah, hundred you know? percent. And you know what? I want to apologize because I, I, I we're kind of like going like all over the place, and that's my fault, bro. So let's get back on a, on somewhat of a timeline. Um, nine eleven happens. I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit, brother. Um, nine eleven happens, and I mean, first of all, you said over uh, a million casualties, right? Uh, uh, from both sides, a ton of casualties. A ton of casualties. Do you do you think that we should have never went there during nine eleven? No, I definitely think we should have gone. We should have gone. Okay. 100%. Okay. So you you jump on that. You on the uh, bob op. You jump on the helicopter. I'm sorry. I got, I got all that. And you get you get you seventh boot to the ground. Yeah. Seventh. Yeah. Yeah. We weren't prepared at all, but we were willing <clears throat> to die, man. It was a great feeling. We were willing to die. These young guys. I was young. You know, I was young. How does that feel? How does that feel willing to die? Um, I was always willing to die, man, in the SEALs, especially in, in, the, in Blackwater. I just was geared like that. How do you, how do you know when you're like willing to die? It was like an honor, you know? How, okay, for, you, for your country, and you love so much yeah. the, the, who you're working under, right? Because it's yeah. not like you're not thinking about the president. You're thinking about just in your presence, the guys that are above. You're not thinking about anything but your guys to your left and your right. Okay. You don't care about the policy. You don't care why you're even there. You know, but I will say Afghanistan, we were juiced up. We were juiced up about that because they just hit our 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 towers. We they just hit America, man, our own people. Yeah. And Ooh. I mean, we were on fire, bro. Yes, sir. And and so when that cold, frigid air of Afghanistan hit our face and we got off that helicopter and I took a knee on that ground for the first time and rocks were digging in my knees. And it was cold. It was crisp cold. We didn't bring any warming layers. I mean, this is early on, brother. Yeah. We went right off the ship in Afghanistan. And the smoke was settling from this AC-130, They just a Spectre gunship that just smoked this entire drug compound. <laughs> uh, you know, and I was, I, my, my only job was to go through this door and clear this a room, and it was blown to pieces. There was no door to go through. And um, when that smoke was clear, and I was like, "Dude, this is what it's all about." This I was born for this. Sheesh. You know what I mean? Let's it go, was. baby! Yeah. Ah. Yo, Shit, I was born you get fired up, man. Yeah. Shit. Um, when you hit when you hit that ground, when you know, pop smoke settling, put your knee in, feel the fucking, you know, smell the motherfucking, you know, bop bop. Um, what, what did you have on you, bro? What did you have on you? Bro, we still had M16s. Do they not have those no more? Well, you know now they have like an M4, okay. You know, carbine with the tel the the telescope stock. You know, is that, that better? Collapsible stock and yeah, because it's shorter. It's like a shorty. Okay. You know, uh, it's you know you can't you can't move around with a Kentucky long rifle like we had. We had those old look like a dang musket, bro. You know what I'm saying? We had a <laughs> yeah. bayonet. Yeah. It's an old M16, but I had a two or three grenade launcher on that sucker. Oh shit! And uh, almost killed my lieutenant with that thing, but. Um, yeah, man, we we were loaded down though, bro. We were loaded down, grenades, everything. Yeah, and you got your pack with like what MREs and stuff like that. You or? got your pack loaded down with uh, field stripped MREs, um, maybe a poncho, your sleeping bag, um, a couple couple pairs of camis. Man, we were so nasty. After I, I didn't take a shower the whole time in Afghanistan. It was so cold, so miserable. These 15-hour patrols every other night. And uh, when we got back to the ship, man, I was like, dang, I'm tan, bro. And I was, and I, But it was just layers and layers and layers of dirt embedded in me. Wow. And they just, they literally, we just, <clears throat> our camis were, were, were falling off of us. They were rotting off of us. And we just... I remember we piled all these camis up in a huge pile, and they just threw them away. They just chunked them over the side of the ship. And so this is while you're active duty as a Marine. Yep. Okay. When you when you uh, so you you went boots on the ground, did whatever you had to do. Yeah. And then you had to bounce back to the ship initially. Yeah. Yeah. And then we went back home, and we were we were relieved by another unit. Okay. And then they pushed on. Okay. Yeah. And then is it after that you applied for Blackwater? Yeah, um, yeah, I was I was tired of the marine lifestyle. Why? 
And what's the marine bro, lifestyle? It, it's like hazing all the time. Like it's brutal between it's, the between the fellas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Between, hazing. Yeah, yeah. But then you're, you know, I was a senior marine by then, and now I'm hazing my guys because that's all I know. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? You're, you're, you swear you'll never do that to your guys when you're when you're like that, and then you find yourself doing the exact same thing. Yeah. Well, it's a fraternity, man. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. You're going to have fun with each other. Yeah. And and so, and I was living in a flat top, so like Korean, just, just the lifestyle, man, just the, as a Marine grunt, man. I was 0311, so. What's a flat top? A flat top barracks is like an old Korean style, you know, just a, just four four walls and a little, in a flat roof. Yeah. And just rack, 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 rack. And I was in that for several years. And Where was that? Where was that stationed at? That was in Camp Horno. Uh, Camp Pendleton, California, West Coast. Okay, I was always West Coast. Yeah, and uh, and so stayed in that man. Rats are everywhere, you know. And uh, why would they make the living conditions for our, you know, for the men that are fighting for this country? Well, it would be a little more better than that. Bro. In, in the uh, Marines, man, there's two things. It's it's about mission accomplishment. The mission accomplished, you know, is number one. Um, troop welfare is like way down here on number two. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they don't care about troop welfare. Now, yeah. things maybe maybe things have changed. I doubt it. You know, the traditions don't change in the Marines. Um, and so I doubt things have changed that much. And so I got out, bro. I was done with that, man. And how long how long ago did you serve for the Marines? Four years. Four years. Yeah. And okay. then I, I and then I did four years in active reserve. Uh, but four years active. And so what what is four years in in a, basically, active, basically, uh, you do you you got to do four years and then four years in active reserve is like basically like you're called up at any time. But I was in Blackwater, so I so I did that. So that time got counted for me too. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, so double whammy. But I got out wanting to be a seal. Yeah. And but like I said, you took the test, right, bro? I had no formal education. Okay. I had zero education, man. What does that test look like? The SEAL test. The, the, it's, well, it's the, it's the basic ASVAB test to get in the Navy, you know? And considering how you score on that in mechanical comprehension, all these different things, yeah, uh, reading comprehension, all this, um, your score determines kind of what job you can go into. And, bro, I was so stupid uh, that I, the first time I took the ASVAB, I made a, a 17 and I was 17 years old. That's about as bad as you can be, man. So, <laughs> so keep chugging out there, guys. Keep 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 moving, man. If you if you're if you you're having a hard time because it, it just took me a while because I had no formal education. Yeah, I, I didn't care about nothing. Um, and then so the second third time I took the ASVAB now out out of the Marines. This time I scored a 48, but you need a 50. Damn, just you, missed it. Oh, bro, and you, you need a 50 to. Uh, a minimum of 50 to go to the seals. Yeah. Yeah. You, you had to get all these minimum standards. And, um, and so I, I, I took the test. I got a 48 and this old lady was great in it. And all she was doing was marking red, 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 red. And I was like praying to God. I was praying to God. Cause if I failed this one, I wasn't going to get to, to retake it for like another two years. Okay. And so I'm praying, I'm praying. I'm, I'm like, you know, um, you know, lie, steal, cheat, whatever it takes to, to get in the seals, man. And, and, <laughs> And she gets me a she gives me a forty eight, and you she goes ah oh, you can get one point waverable like one point, and I'm like okay and she's like forty nine, and I was one point away from the fifty. Wow! I was like come on I begged her cut me some slack. Yeah. And I, I, but I love this part <clears throat> of the story, man. I love this part of the story, man, because in our life, man, we have these other dudes that come along in our life, and uh, that we see and look up to. And it's so important if you're one of those guys out there that people look up to, to do this every once in a while. Because as I was walking out that door, this was changing my life forever, this moment. I was walking out that door and I was so mad, bro. So frustrated with my life. You know, drop out of school, did the Marines, but man, I, I still can't be a SEAL, my dream. I'm walking out the door and there was this big ass dude with a green beret and he had these medals on his chest and he was like just stacked and racked. Yeah. Jacked, you know, by the door. Yes, sir. And he was huge, and and he was standing there just like a statue. And I just walked past him with my head down, and he grabbed me. He goes, "Hey, bro, like, you know, put your head up." And I was like, "I was like, what?" And he was like, "This ain't your day, man." He goes, "But maybe tomorrow is." And I said, "I said, man, what do you mean by that?" He's like, "Well, he's like, uh, you ever heard about Blackwater?" And I said, "No." He goes, 
dude, they're doing crazy shit over there right now. They're doing crazy stuff. You should go and, and try out for Blackwater, put your stuff in, and then go to the SEALs. When you mature more, you know, when you get more experience and stuff and, and learn more, you know. And so I thought, dude, if it wasn't for that guy, my life probably would be different. And uh, so I went home. I applied for Blackwater. It was just barely starting. Eric Prince had just barely started Blackwater. Yeah. And um, I put my this resume in. I didn't even know how to write a resume. <laughs> I just wrote a bunch of stuff down, crazy stuff. Like, You've done, yeah. Like, yeah. And uh, I sent it in. They picked me up. Went to the vetting process in Moyark, North Carolina. Uh, a lot of strict shooting skills. A lot of, like, you know, all kinds of different tests, you know. And it was a vetting process. Yes, sir. It's not like a selection. You know, yeah. a selection, you know, Bud's is like a, just a beat down, brutal beat down to, to get in. But What is for, Bud's? A basic underwater demolition school for SEALs. Okay. Which but, we'll get into in a minute. Yeah, but Blackwater yeah. was a vetting process, meaning everything you put down on your paper, you better know, or they're going to find you out. And so I went there, and they had this guy they called the Angel of Death. And uh, he would come in every day. At the end of the day, it was real hard. And he would read off a list of names. And if you read your name, you stood up, walked outside, you never saw that guy again. They put him in a van, and that was it. You, you didn't make black water. So they cut a lot of guys like that. Yeah. So every day you had to go through this. and uh, But luckily I made it, and I flew straight from Moyark, North Carolina, after that vetting process, straight into Baghdad, Iraq. Okay, and so where are we at in Baghdad, Baghdad Iraq, during this time in history? When you getting over there in two thousand, you know when the you ever hear about the Blackwater guys, uh, ex seals and stuff that that were burned on a bridge and hung, and um, they, uh, anyway, so that that was about the same time two thousand four. Okay, uh, late two thousand four. So I mean. was Saddam already? Was two? Uh, my timeline might be a little messed up. So was Saddam already like uh, overthrown, captured, killed? I I, I think, man. I, th I I can't remember, man. But I yeah. think I think Saddam Hussein was like captured in two thousand three, maybe. Okay. But yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, my timeline's a little. It could be up way. Too. It was my my stuff's jacked up there. Yeah. But I went in two thousand early two thousand five, late two thousand four. Okay. And so back to the 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 seals that got hung and burned. You said. They were Blackwater guys. They were Blackwater guys. You know, because a lot of the Blackwater were SEALs and Green Berets and stuff. And they got hung from a bridge in Fallujah and burned. Burned alive, bro. By who? Uh, by insurgents. Mm. By the enemy. And so there was all these terrible, man, pictures of them uh, hanging on the bridge as I, as I was going through the vetting process. Wow. And I was like, dang, this is intense, man. That's where I'm going. I didn't know what to expect. I had been in Afghanistan but then we got dropped right smack down into the hellhole of Iraq. And you lived there for four years? Is that correct? Four years. Man, it was my permanent address for nearly four years. Like three years and, oh, man, three years and nine months, ten months. Share me a little bit about, uh, you know, the day in life during this time in your life, living there, now under <sighs> Blackwater. Um, what exactly you did and how was your your – Man. Daily life, brother. Waking up in the morning. I don't know. Talk to me. Man, it was it was it was wild, man. We would wake up super early in the morning. What's super early? I would say, man, like maybe maybe like five in the morning. Okay, but yeah. like it was you know the sun wasn't up yet. Yeah, that's early when you go to bed late. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. Um, and so sometimes we were hungover. We partied hard too. Yeah, hard, play hard. You know, work hard, play hard. But we would wake up early in the morning, load the trucks up. And these trucks, man, I was on the Red Cell Quick Reaction Force, and there was these massive armored trucks with these tractor tires and these turret gunners and these turret gun positions. So we would load up all the weapons. We would load up all the ammo. I would stack 30 grenades, 30, uh, 40 mic mic, 203 grenades in a, in a, in a bucket next to the, next to the weapon, next to my 240 machine gun. I, I you know, you had to have it pristine and I made sure it was clean. Uh, and then I had my water bottles over here. I was going to throw at cars and to, to warn them. You know, it's better than a bullet, you know? Yeah. Because a lot of people died over there for, like, a small traffic infraction, you know? For sure. Because it was scary. It's scary, you know? And what, so, what was your what was your job to do working under Blackwater? What was Blackwater 
doing out there? They were a private security company, private contractor, right? Private contractors, not not necessarily mercenaries, but private contractors that uh, for the diplomatic for the Department of State diplomatic mission, and uh, basically taking what do you say, like taking like um, the Department of State officials and politicians to their coffee meetings. So they, they want to go to into the red zone. They need somebody to take them, and the military's not taking them. And so we ended up being like a 911 force in Iraq and, and rescuing these teams and rescuing people and and going back and forth, doing eight missions a day. And one of the craziest things, man, was loading those trucks up and then hearing massive bombs going off, like boom, that would rock the whole city, and you're about to go into that, man. These bombs are going off as you're loading the truck, and you got to stay steady. You know, you got to shake yourself out of that. You got to be like, all right, here we go. So there's like a lot of joking and smoking going on. But really, man, it's just nervousness. So, okay, so back to you loading these trucks up in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, you're loading the trucks up because you're getting ready to es- give an escort. Es- to a political es- figure. Escort a p- political figure, depending on what you were doing in the teams. But, but I pretty much did every position in Blackwater. You know, from the trunk monkey laying in the back, just shutting my mouth, watching everything, to the left and right door gunner, where you were strapped in with a D-ring and an SUV to where you could lean out of the, the side of the, the trucks, the armored trucks. That's dope. Strapped with, in with a D-ring? <laughs> strapped in with a D-ring. Yeah. Uh, leaning out the door Yeah. on these skids. And then we had this, we called them hate trucks. And this hate truck was rhino gutted and then rhino plastied. Okay. And then we had the... The Beastie Boys on as loud as you can, and then, <laughs> and then we have the 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 center the center hard benches down the middle, and then all these gun racks, and then D rings on these lines, and then you had a, a, a squad automatic weapon, machine guns, belt fed machine guns, two or three grenades, all this stuff, and uh, they called it the hate truck. It had a big ass huge grill on it, a massive bumper, and it looked like a rainbow was colored on there with all the different cars that it hit. Red, blue, yellow. <laughs> and when you hit a car with the hate truck, it opens like a can opener, man. Okay. And, and it's 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 bad, brother. The bad. hate truck. Yeah, yeah, the hate truck. And uh, so then I was I was a driver. Driver's probably the most important spot. Okay. Know? I mean, you mean you gotta be you gotta be on your game like the movie Heat. You yeah. know, you gotta be like like driver in heat, just like ready, man. And um and then I did uh Agent in charge, you know, the guy that's standing next to the principal, did all that cheesy work. Uh, and then eventually uh, I was put in the rear turret gunner of the Red Cell teams. And uh, that's a super important part, watching your buddy six. That's one of the most important part of the team. It's a very vulnerable spot in your back, yeah. right? Like I'm sure in prison too, man. It's like, you know, you're always watching your back. Like you need somebody to, to be watching your six. And, and, uh, and so that lead turret gunner, that lead turret gunner is really important too. So I did both of those for a long time, eight missions a day for a long time. The day I left my team to go be a team leader, to run a team, uh, was um, the day I left the guy that took over my position in that turret gunner. He got blown out, blown out, completely blown out onto, onto his head with a massive firefight. And that's how crazy it was. I was how, doing, how, go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. I was doing like three to eight missions a day. That's nuts. For months. And the day I left, this dude that took my spot, really good cat, uh, he got blown out. And the guy behind him lost part of his arm. How does it feel to be in uh, that type of war zone, man? And, you know... And to, uh, to lose one of your buddies, to see him get get killed. I mean, do you have to, I, I can imagine that probably builds a callus after a while, right? You have to keep, you still gotta go keep working, right? And it's protecting yourself and the ones around you. Man, it touched everybody. The war touched everybody. There was a guy that used to, I could hear him praying, um, praying in his room above me. And one day I left and, um, he got smoked. The rocket hit. One of the one of your Blackwater. Uh, yeah, one, one of the Blackwater guys got smoked. And you would hear him praying above you. Yeah, I hear I hear him praying above me. 
And then we had to bag up all this stuff and send it home to his wife. Okay, so you heard him, I'm sorry, you heard him praying above you and the next day he got smoked. Yeah. Does he, was he, did he have the wrong mindset in a sense of this, brother? Like, man, you had to have a dog, you had to have an animalistic, you know, I always quote that, that, that quote, be careful when chasing monsters for you may become one. And I, and I, I became a monster in Iraq. You had to. You had I mean, to, did anybody ever hear you praying out loud like that? No, man. I, I, I was always doing some prayers, man. I was, I was always. Doing, I think, I think you're crazy if, if you don't, if you're not praying to God yeah. in, in, a, in a war. You know, of course, some, some guys they, they don't believe in God, but I sure did. And, and, um, I don't want to be arrogant and say, well, that's what why I was okay and others didn't because. But my point was, they that the war touches everybody. You know, one way or another, one way or another, it's going to touch you. You're going to, you're going to get touched. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to hit, you're going to get hit. Have you seen any dudes like mentally just break down? Like they just, they cracked? Uh, yeah. Later, years later in the hospital, for um, sure. I seen dudes that were just, man, I can't even begin to tell you. I had a guy walk in my hospital room on the polytraumatic ward in, in James Haley veterans hospital in Tampa and that was my experience, first experience seeing dudes that were just really, I mean, no joke, messed up. Like, you know, there's PTSD, and then there's these dudes yeah. that were, like, seeing hallucinations, like dead people, dead Iraqis walking in their room at night, talking to them. I mean, just screaming as loud as you can. Crazy. You couldn't even go out with these guys. Like, we like we try to take some bowling trips and stuff. I didn't want to go out with them anymore because it was so depressing. Yeah. Because guys, they, they they were gone, bro. They were gone, man. Just from war. Just from the from... war. Just done. Forever. Yeah. Forever. I mean, ain't no coming back from some of that stuff. No. I can remember one time they told me to go down to the pool at James Haley Veterans Hospital when I was there. And they told me to go down to the pool and to do water aerobics. And here I was a SEAL, bro, but I was injured. And so I, I'm, I'm at this hospital, and I'm like, I don't want to go do water aerobics, man. I used to like swim in the ocean, bro, and and now I got to go do with floaties on, like in a little pool with all these other uh, wounded vets and stuff. You thought it was too goofy or what? Yeah, it's just it's just like demoralizing, man. Hundred percent. You go from the apex of your game in the teens. Now you're doing water aerobics <laughs> at a hospital, you know, yeah. like recovery. And I remember going down there and I and I got in the water and I was having the worst day ever. And then um, and the instructor was like Jimmy. Jimmy, you got to like join your class. And I was ignoring her and I just was staring out the window and I seen this dude and he was paralyzed from the neck down in a wheelchair. And there was this beautiful young girl next to him, like a 20 year old girl. And it was his wife, obviously. They were both young. And she was feeding him through a straw water, you know, and he was like this. And that was going to be their condition for the rest of their life. And man, when I saw that, brother, when I saw that, I, I I shook all over and I turned around and I joined that freaking class, bro. And I started, I got my shit together after that because I realized, man, you ain't there, Jimmy. Don't you, don't you ever freaking be ungrateful again and be, and be all crying in a pool in the kitty, you know? So no matter where you are in this life, no matter like how bad your circumstance is, there's always somebody who's getting fed through a straw. And, and how long was that relationship going to last, man? Who I know. I know, dog. That's crazy. Yeah, man, after that day, I got my stuff together, man. And the cool part about it, she's probably going to end up with one of his buddies. My baby, yeah. <laughs> Straight up. Um, I appreciate these stories, brother, and I appreciate you so much. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is absolutely amazing. I know we're just kind of like, skimming through things, combing through, you know, your life a little bit in a sense. Um, Cause I, I watched some, I watched some of your interviews, bro. Cause I had to just, I had a cram for a test yesterday and that's how I felt with you. You're you know thorough I mean? though, man. You prep, you prep, bro. Well, well, you know, I, I just, I just listened and I, and I was like, all right, they really went in depth right here. And there's guys, there's, oh, let me put it over here. The guys, there's interviews, bro, where he will talk in depth about as much as he can on certain things, you know what I mean? But I just kind of wanted to do it you know, hoodstock style, you know what I mean? And just shoot, shoot the breeze, shoot yeah, from the hip yeah. type of stuff. I like it. So from Marines to Blackwater, when was your first kill? 
Was it as a Marine or did it happen to a Blackwater? No, no, it, it was not in the, I think I maybe killed a camel in a, uh, in Marines. There was yeah. some camels out there we smoked. Why but, do you, why do you, why do you, why would you kill a camel? Uh, dude, you know, you see movement, you see movement out there in front of you and you just like go haywire, you know, a bunch of Marines, you're trigger happy, bro. Yeah. You're like, you know, if it moves, you know, shoot it, kill. Uh, is, is a herd it, of camels got killed, a whole herd, man. Is but is that something as a marine? Like we talk, you talked about like the what's the word, bro? Like the not the morale, but just being a marine. You know what I mean? Like everybody probably wants their first kill, right? Bro, you're ch- you're chanting songs like "What makes the grass grow? Blood, blood, blood." Yes, you know what I mean. Stuff like that all the time. Yeah, you know. But you could potentially get yourself in trouble for killing something from oh, your for own sure. from the government, which you've experienced. And we'll get into that soon. For sure. Um, so you got to be careful still. You got you got to and you got to trust rules, the guys around man. you too, right? You got to play by the rules. You got to think outside the box. You got you got to really. You got to look at it like this, man. Is my life in danger or not? You know, we all see YouTubes out there where there's like a a shoot, a cop kills this dude, and you're like, "Come on, bro!" Like that dude wasn't even armed, bro. And George, George Floyd. George Floyd. And you, yeah, you're freaking out. You're freaking out like a, like a punk, like a, a some bitch shit, huh? Oh, some real, some real. Yeah, exactly. And excuse my language. No, no, this, this I, I hear you. And yeah. they, so so. You see these people get killed all the time because these cops are scared, yes. you know. And but there's no reason to be scared. Panic is contagious, but also courage is contagious. Yes, sir. You know, patience. You know, is and so you got to remain calm as a cucumber, man. I just I would chill, man. In firefights, I was cool, calm, reloading, bullets snapping by your head face like a bull whip. But my first skill was in uh, obviously in Blackwater. And so Blackwater, it seems like Blackwater was just, uh, for one thing, you guys had a lot of action in the sense of, like maybe in the Marines or something like that. And you talked about it in an interview, so I'm kind of just repeating what I heard you say. But in, say, the Marines, you can be under a gunfight, sniper rifle, and you got to call in to to get get the get the green light to to take the dude out. Yeah, exactly. But in Blackwater, <laughs> in Blackwater, you know you're traveling around in a city like New York. Right? Okay. I mean, I mean, you're talking about like four million people in Baghdad, Iraq. Yeah. And you're traveling in these extremely congested, crazy traffic circles all over the place, and and buildings everywhere. Gunshots going off all the time. You know, you know, gunshot goes off in the city. It's hard to tell where it came from. Yeah, because it, it 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 echoes off off walls and glass. So. Yes, sir. And so and so and so when you got a machine gun going off, multiple machine guns. I mean, you don't know if it's on top of you or like right across the block, and you're just like, oh my god, where'd I go? What'd I do? You know, where's it coming from? And so it's just chaos, man, all the time. And then you got you got the worst drivers in the world in in Baghdad, Iraq. The absolute worst drivers in the world, man. It's it's insane, bro. And Do you have to have a driver's license to drive out there? I don't think so, homie. Yeah. I, I don't think so. And I mean, is there anyone making traffic stops out there? Oh, no, no. I actually saw a, a guard, an Iraqi guard once. He was directing traffic by standing in the middle of the four-way with an AK-47. <laughs> he would shoot it in the air like twice, and a car would go by. And then this car started moving forward, and he shot the car in the radiator with the AK, bro. I know that story sounds crazy. I saw this with my own eyes, and it's hard for me to even believe it to this day. Like yeah. He just literally shot the guy's car to make him stop, and now he's like radiator fluid coming out, you know? But, yeah, bad drivers. And the problem with that is you got a turret gunner with a machine gun up there, and and his rules of engagement, like what allows him to kill you or not, is basically like, is my life in threat? Is my buddy's life in jeopardy or the equipment. Well, if a car if a car is barreling down at you, but it's the worst driver in the world, and they're not paying attention, they're getting smoked. And that happened a lot, man, in Iraq. Because they just weren't paying attention. But you don't know if it's a 2,000-pound bomb coming at you or just a really crappy driver. So you had to use some discretion. But let's say you don't shoot, and then it just liquefies your team, you know? 
Wow. And so this is this is are you speaking in general or is this while working with Blackwater? I'm speaking in in Blackwater, yeah. In Blackwater all, all the time, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Blackwater man was a, just a whole different animal from the Marines to Blackwater now. Private security, so you guys are basically 911 right there. You're doing everything that uh no one else really wants to do, but you're getting paid to do this. Getting paid good money. Good, you know what was it? You said five hundred. It was five hundred to a thousand a day, man. Wow, that's good money. Mm -hmm. That's good money. Well, I mean, what was it? Was it every week? Every two weeks? Direct deposit? How did that work out? Once a month. Okay. If I remember right, it was once a month. Yeah. Like one time, I went home, and then you got a twenty percent bonus at the end of the year. Nice. Um, I remember one time I went home and I forgot about that twenty percent bonus, and yeah. I had all this cash, man. Like, I, like I come home from a deployment with maybe like 80k wow and so you know that's a lot of cash in your checking account for mm. a young dude right from yeah. where and i would always play these extravagant vegas trips you know blow it all man just blow it all and <laughs> now i remember i was i was going to the gym one day and i got a notification that no 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 i i i, I was walking out to the gym and i got a, a letter from blackwater i opened it up it was like twenty two thousand dollars and a bonus check, you know? Nice. And I, I was like, I ain't going to the gym. I'm going to party, you know? So I didn't go to the gym like an ass man. But but I deposited that sucker, you know? Yeah. That was crazy money. What would, what would partying consist of uh, during these days, bro? Like, oh, man, what are we doing, bro? bro? I used to see it crazy, man. Do we got to, you know what they yeah, say? You know. Whatever happens in Vegas stays in yeah, Vegas. Yeah. You never really want to. Whatever happens in Vegas happens in Vegas, man. Yeah, You know, but yeah. So, so you know. Well, you know, we'd band together a, a bunch of a bunch of dudes in Blackwater, and then we'd plan these crazy trips. Okay, and usually it always ended up in Vegas. Yeah, and then we'd be like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna go here, we're gonna go here, because when you're when you're in that Baghdad environment, you're like fantasizing about, you know, like what you gonna do when you get like, home. What you gonna do, man? Yes, sir. Like, okay, with these women over here, this, 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 and 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 then obviously, man, it would end up in drugs and all kinds of crazy shenanigans and hedonism, uh, in in Afghan in in Vegas. Uh, and then you come, then you come home just trashed, out of money, back to Iraq. <laughs> yeah, let's go get you know? this. Let's go get this bag, and hopefully be able to survive. Right? Um, how are the women in uh, Baghdad, bro? Um, you got a couple crazy. baby. You probably got a couple baby mamas out that way. Yeah, no? probably dead one hundred percent, bro. Um, <laughs> no, I, I got this. so so this one girl. Um, I dated this Peruvian girl once. She was cool. They're beautiful, bro. Peruvian she brides beautiful. are beautiful, yeah, bro. Yeah, she was beautiful. And then um, I saw um, we broke up, and I was with my boys. And the women are, are scarce there. They're they're scarce, man. They're not. There's not many out there, bro. And 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 they're covered up, right? Well, I'm talking about uh, Americans and, and or British. Okay, or, they're or living contractors out there. and stuff or military. Yes, sir. Females. And so, but it's scarce, Pickens, you know, it's scarce. And so, um, and so I was at the pool, the bag, Saddam Hussein's palace pool, and we would hang out there until a rocket hit there, you know. Yeah. But um, we would hang out there and just chill all day if we weren't working. Yeah. And uh, I remember telling my boys, hey, man, the next girl that comes in here, um, watch, I'm going to go up to her, I'm going to swim up to her, and I'm going to get her number. And they're like, whatever, dog. I mean, and I didn't care who it was that came in that through that gate. Yeah. And this girl came in. Her name was Alia. And she was beautiful. And she had uh, she was from Iraq, but had moved to Canada and her family and stuff. And then she was back working with Stanley Baker. And I I swam up to her. I was nervous, bro, because she was beautiful. And I so I swam over to her. I got out of the pool and I and I and she just was reading her book. She never even like looked up at me or nothing, just kept reading her book. And I was like, "Yo, please, I know, I know you're gonna reject me, but can you act like you're talking to me, and and, and give give me your number?" And so, so, <laughs> and she's like, "You're stupid," you know. Yeah. And so we kicked it off, and, and we ended up dating a long time, bro. A oh, long shoot. time. Yeah, a long time. We so, traveled all around. Mar we traveled to Morocco, Morocco, uh, Marrakesh, everywhere. How was this pool? How was Saddam Hussein's pool, bro? Bro, it was epic, bro. It was something out of the movies, man. Um, Saddam Hussein's palace was huge. You know, he, I think he had like seven different palaces, but this one he had um, uh, the palace pool was, it was just this, it looked kind of like, you know, an epic pool in Vegas. Yes, sir. You know, big, and he had a couple pools. Yeah. But we go to this main one by his palace and, uh, you know, everybody kind of chill there. I mean, dude, this guy, Saddam Hussein, was living extravagant lifestyle, bro. I mean, to have a pool in fucking 
Baghdad, right? Like they, next level, bro. Yeah, like they don't have pools out there, right? Yeah. Do it, they have public pools or anything no, like that? No, 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 no. No, right? It's like poverty, man. Yes. The worst, dude. And so, but this, but this palace was huge, man. This massive palace. In fact, when you first walked through the door, they said they said that's where you used to feed people to lions, because you know when you walk through this big, massive, massive doors, man, in this massive palace, you walk in and it's like the, an octagon. Yeah, it's like a small octagon. Okay, and and you look up and there's like there's like seats real high, looking down at this octagon as you walk in, where you know like kind of at a ballet or something where people like you know you know nerds with the with the with the binoculars are looking at people yes and so they're you know where people could sit and watch down mm -hmm. there's no other reason and then there was a drain in the middle of this octagon <laughs> and that's what i heard it was for yeah i never confirmed that but man it was pretty wicked bro pretty crazy he fed people to lions he straight up was feeding people to lions, uh, people to lions yeah it's fucking nuts bro so were you living in one of his palaces at the time? I was living next door to the palace in the man camp. And, but so you had action to go there. I mean, what was his palace serving for? Just for the guys to go hang out at? I mean, what was no, going man. on in that palace? So so they, they ended up using his palace for the U.S. Embassy. Oh, okay. You know, the United States always takes everybody's stuff and yeah. uses it for different stuff, confiscates your stuff, the government. Yeah. The U.S. basically took his palace and said, hey, thanks for this. We're going to use it as an embassy now. Okay. And so it was like the U.S. Embassy, and we would go over there. I'd make a call home. You know, I'd call call my parents or something every once in a while. First time I was ever walking up to the to the Baghdad Palace because it was huge. Very first time I was going to go call my mom tell her I made it to Baghdad, Iraq. And it was late at night, and right as I was walking up, a rocket just smashed into the top of the palace and went through a couple floors and killed a couple people. Wow. So I just turned around and went back to my barracks, man, to, to the man camp. How how was how was your your support with your family, moms, pops, during you know these times, bro? You fuck, man. Man, my mom. You know that's that's one thing I can say, man. My my parents were so always supportive of me, even though I was wild and crazy, and, and not like the other kids, not picking up everything. You know, I mean, they 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 put a lot of love and tender care in me, man, and, and really tried. They they tried, you know what I'm saying. Do you have siblings? I had a little brother that died. My condolences, yeah, yeah, yeah. bro. Thanks, man. So you're the only child, basically. Uh, my my sister. Your sister, okay. Yeah. You have a sister, older or younger? Older sister. Okay. Yeah, but I had, I had great parents, man. They they always were supportive, you know. And and man, I'll tell you what, man. During my time on house arrest and in, in times of my life, if I didn't have the kind of parents I did, that ended up taking me back in my mom, taking me back in her house when I was on house arrest, so. I don't know if I I don't know if I would have had anything to live for. So when I look at other people, other dudes, man, and they didn't have that, they didn't have that mom, they didn't have that dad. I give so mad props to to dudes out there that didn't have some of the the, the support that I had. You know, huge, right? It's 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 everything. Foundation, support system. Bro, it's everything. Hard times, someone to reach out to. Yeah, cuz if you don't have that, you have nothing to live for. You have nothing to live for in this life. I mean, and, and so if you can if you can walk through that fire, not having nobody, and you you'd be unstoppable in this world. Whew. There's a lot of guys too that are listening to this that don't haven't had none of that. Can't imagine, man. They're still, uh, you know, they walk through the fire and they keep your heads up, motherfuckers. Keep your head, saying. keep your heads up, man. Yeah. Um. So. Baghdad, back in Baghdad. Sorry about that, bro. Um, yeah. But I appreciate you sharing, man. Um, so Baghdad is, you know, everyday life we were talking, I'm interested in just like, you said the city is just as big as New York? Yeah, I mean, I think New York's a little bigger, but just your, Baghdad, Iraq is huge. What do they got? They got stores, liquor stores. I mean, what kind of drink we they drinking out there? Ain't you nobody guys drinking nothing. Well, yeah, I know they have all kinds of liquor and booze out there, bro. They, they, they do some crazy stuff, man. But, but... There's like bazaars. What is that? Like a bazaar is like a shopping center, you know. But that that, but like back in the Aladdin times, you know, like the tents and the sheets and stuff. <laughs> oh, like that? Yeah, yeah, They're, just like Aladdin. Yeah, you know, like the cartoon. And and they got like they got like 
you know, millions of people walk around in stores everywhere. And then they have like the Ministry of Oil, the Ministry of Interior, these big, these big buildings that we turned into government buildings when we when we occupied Baghdad, Iraq. Bro, we smoke checked that place. We hit that place with so many missiles and, and, and bombs before we went in there and invaded Iraq. When when I got there in Blackwater, there was like sides of buildings missing. Like transformers walk walk through there, bro. Like straight up like yeah. a really nice building and then the 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 back half of it gone. Yeah. You know? It's like dang, nobody survived that. Nobody. A lot of uh civilians, a lot of innocent people died, huh? A lot of civilians died, man. You know? Like, don't don't be sinning. Don't don't be training guys millions and millions of dollars and putting in training young men to go to war. Uh don't do it. Circle the wagons. Dude, I've seen so much war, so much hell. I've seen stuff, man. I don't even know if I can say on this podcast, bro. I mean, I've seen some I've seen some fucked up stuff, man. You know? I don't even know how else to say it. I've seen a woman pulling her hair out because her two kids got smoked in the back of a seat. I mean, you don't get rid of those screams, bro. You don't get rid of those screams. How do you deal with that? Uh, you don't. You don't deal with it. You don't. You don't deal with that shit. You just lock it away tight, like a like a so like a. They say, you know, you want to make a sailboat unsinkable. You go around and you close every hatch as tight as you can. Whew. And when that storm comes. I had a I had a neighbor years back, maybe six years ago. Um, I believe he served in the Iraq War, the Baghdad. You know, he was there. Yeah. Um, and he had a huge problem with noise, loud noises. And I remember one time I had bought I bought a truck, 2014 Chevy Silverado, whatever. I guess I had the music on too loud, you know. And he actually, and it was you know, it was apartment building. He actually came down and said, "Hey." He said, I can hear that upstairs, man. Turn that down. You know what I mean? I turned it down, but. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. It really, really, the PTSD with that dude, and I'm, I'm sure it's across the board with a lot of veterans, man, and my respect to, to all the veterans, but some people are able to do what you do. Lock it away. Lock it away. Lock it away. And some people, they just. They ain't wired like that. Huh. You know, yeah. some, some guys, I noticed that, man. Some guys, man, hit their head on an air conditioning in Kuwait. And say they got PTSD. Yeah, you know what I mean. Some people are juicing the system. You say playing yeah, the role. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? I, yeah, I think so. I gotta, yeah. I gotta be careful how I say that. Hundred percent. Because you could have like a, a girl, yeah. a girl that's seen like this this much of something traumatic, and have major uh, the same amount of impact as I have seen a bunch of stuff. Exactly. Just because we're we're just different people. Wired up different. Physiologically, you know, we're just different. Yes, Wired. Sir. <clears throat> I would say a lot of my PTSD actually came from, I mean, whatever you want to call it, trauma, whatever, operator syndrome, whatever happened to me, man, ha there was a combination of things, Tr you know, crazy stuff in Iraq. And then um, being prosecuted over it, uh, being, being, being kind of gone after, you know, that but, fucked you up. That messed me up, bro. Big time. Because here you are fighting for your country. Yeah. Doing your job. And now, they're coming after you, and we're talking about the Nizar Square. How do you say Nizar Square? Yeah. Nizar Square. You, and they, you, they, and you. This is when you were got put to another unit that you were in charge of, correct? Yeah, I ended up being a team leader for this for one of the Quick Reaction Force teams, and uh, and there was all kinds of firefights going on. I mean, it wasn't every day, but it was crazy, man, and it was heating up, and you could feel this ominous presence coming, like this a storm on Blackwater. Yeah, something like they, bad coming. Yeah, you, you could hear like the Bolo reports, and, and then you had you had like messages from our intel saying they had bounties on our heads. They were pissed off at us, like like and and, and it seemed like we were getting shot at all the time. Our helicopters were getting shot out of the sky. Uh, dudes were dying. Um, How dangerous are these dudes? These insurgents? Yeah, insurgents. I mean, I mean, they got balls, man. Because they're know? willing to die for. Well, yeah, cause, cause check it out, man, and I, and I always respected them. I never hated nobody or nothing. I, I always thought it was a really fair game, cause I thought, man, if these dudes stepped in my backyard, lucky, me and you would grab whatever we could, and we go to a freaking war. Hundred percent. What war? 
Yeah. You know, and we do brutal, brutal stuff if, if they're in your backyard. So they're doing what they have to do, you feel? So I felt like it was a fair game. Okay. In fact, I felt kind of like I was the enemy there. Yeah. You know? Because um, you're in their house. You're in their I mean, they're, I mean, they're, 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 they're territory. They're grounds. Yeah. And they're fighters, man. You know, they're fighters. Uh, uh, maybe not, not as crazy as the Taliban. Maybe not as crazy as them, but, but they're, they're crazy. And you don't, no, they're it, crazy, man. And it's hard to, it's, it's safe to say that it's hard to know who's who. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You never know. Yeah, because they'd be fighting each other. Okay. Like gang wars, like like Shiites and Sunnis. Yeah. Like literally shooting it out on the streets. And and then we roll past, and both of them are like bullet magnet. Both of them start fighting, you know, shooting at us. So chaos right there, man. It's fucking... Yeah, it was chaos. And, and then you got the Nisar Square happened. So the Nisar Massacre, they said, you know, uh, that I was the team leader of. And so it was my call, my decision to go out to uh, to uh, to save another team. And that day was pretty much would change my life forever. Okay. So that shootout happens or that, that incident happens, that day that's marked in history that – yeah, a lot of people talk about that, and you were actually there. And um, after that incident happened, Blackwater asked you to go. That's right. Okay, and um, a lot of people got killed. A lot of civilians got killed. A lot of civilians got killed, man. Yeah. And so from there, because I, I I think we can get back to that in the sense of you know what I mean because they ended up prosecuting. Right, but putting up charges. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's a very complex, long judicial story system. Yeah, type deal. But but at the end of the day, four, four of the guys or five guys uh, went to prison uh, for 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 basically life sentences. I mean, thirty years mandatory on seventeen counts of violence with a machine gun, and then Trump pardoned them after seven years. Shout to Trump for that, huh? Big shout out. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Big shout out to Trump for that, man. Sheesh. That so, shows you something, though. 100%. It tells you something about the story. Yeah. Political. Absolutely. So, you, after that, they, Blackwater, after the incident, such a heavy incident, a lot of paperwork involved uh, because of what happened. You know, innocent casualties, they say. Yeah. Right? Um, you go to the SEALs after that. Yeah. You go to the SEALs. You take the test again? Yeah, this time. And you time, pass it this time? This time, man. I scored like a, a an 89, bro. Oh, damn. I, Flying I, colors. Man, that just goes to show you, man. You you, you steadily chop at that tree one 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 hard swig at a time with the right sharp axe, and you're going to fall that tree. That tree's going to fall down eventually, and that's what I did. And uh, But it was a very, very difficult road because you got to think about it. When I, bro, when I, when I came back home from the Nisar Square, like my life was on shambles, man. They were putting fent, uh, they were giving me fentanyl for my little injury, my um, lower tab. I was drinking like a, uh, drinking like a sailor, man. Drinking that Jack Daniels every day, and um, and man, I I remember that that door, that window was closing on my dream to be a seal, and everybody's like, my lawyer's like, Jimmy, you you could get like prison time hardcore like don't waste your time everybody's like don't waste your time going to the seals it's a, it's already hard enough as it is yeah the attrition uh uh that dropout rate in the seals is is atrocious um uh, you know i don't care what anybody says it's, it's tough and so to get into the seals to, to get in and then to to yeah to make it through the two-year process or more and so that alone was daunting because like, what's gonna happen if I if I don't make it? I'm gonna go paint a, a ship or scrub barnacles on a ship, you know, and, and and so I had that looming over me, and then this massive legal storm cloud, and so it was like mission impossible, brother. But I man, I sit there and I was taking these fentanyl patches, slamming eight, nine, ten lower tab a day, you know, Viking and stuff, and drinking this Jack, uh, you know. And I, I can remember watching Finding Nemo. I tell this story a lot, but man, it's so <laughs> it's so powerful, bro. Uh, a cartoon, a kid's cartoon with my niece. Uh, 
Yeah. And I'm sitting there watching this big screen TV, finding Nemo. And I don't care about nothing. I'm drinking, got my fentanyl on. And the seals, like all this stuff's in the, in the dark, in the dark. You know, like you have these dreams and they're just looming around in the dark when you're sedated and when you're you're not right. You know, you're not centered in this life. And I remember watching that Finding Nemo movie. And at the very end, it just said, keep moving forward on, on the big screen. And man, when I saw that, and I looked over, and I was trying to be this good uncle for my niece. You ain't no, you're not a good uncle. You're not a good dad when you're like that. You can't be. You're not present. And I saw her, and I looked at that screen, and it was just this, this dang cartoon. But it, but it was like Mission Impossible. Just keep moving forward, man. No matter what. And so, man, I stood up, bro. I ain't gonna lie. I stood up. I went to the bathroom. I I poured everything I had out out. out Poured everything I had out, the fentanyl, trash, everything, all these pills, filled up the toilet, and flushed that sucker. And I and I put my running shoes on and just started running until I threw up. And I was sick like a dog, bro. And then I ran again every single day, Sheesh. wash and repeat, bro, wash and repeat. <laughs> and about a, about a year that went by of hardcore training and just taking one swing of that tree every day. Yes, sir. Just one swing. Hard swing, and then eventually, eventually, I was I was allowed to go in the seals, even with all this crazy stuff going on in the background, like like a monster over me all the time. You said you got this case looming over this, you, this fear, bro. Yeah, this, this dread. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, and not just a, not just that, but these night terrors, you know, uh, of what of some of the stuff I've seen in Iraq and in that of the Nisar Square. Yes, sir. You know, and, and the weight, brother, of the weight of this decision, you know, as a leader, man, you know, you bear the full brunt of responsibility. And I've never shifted responsibility as a leader of that team. I have never have. I've, I've always stayed true to that. Like, dude, I take full responsibility for that day for making the decision to go out. And a lot of people try to deflect me and say, no, Jimmy, it ain't your fault. Well, I made the decision to go out. If I wouldn't have made the decision that none of this would happen, but the the weight on my shoulders from from making a decision that guys went to prison for, yeah, straight up is, is I mean, you might as well have guys die in your team, and you can't initial you can't you can't talk about why, even though you were the team leader, you made the decision to go out, but you I, I heard on one of your interviews that you can't talk about why you weren't initially, well. <laughs> Well, I'll say this. It's, it's all public. It's all in the records. Um, and uh, uh, they they basically, um, they looked at the reports. I'll just say that. They, they looked at the reports we wrote afterwards. And as a team leader, I gave a report uh, as an eagle eye view of the thing. And so. They if, went based on that. If you, if, 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 um, if you were a turret gunner yeah. that day, they, they knew that you shot. So they went after all the guys that were turret gunners. To go after me, they just really didn't know what I did. Yeah. And the FBI came to my house at one point, and I refused to talk to them. I was, I was super rude, man. My mom was like, why are you so rude to them, Jimmy? Like, don't you know, man? These guys are like, you piss them off. They're going to they're go back and report you as just being an asshole. I said, I don't care. Get out of my house. And it was at my parents' house. These two FBI agents, they were like, all right. And, uh, and so... Um, I told my lawyer, I was like, I ain't saying nothing, man. He's like, just keep, just keep quiet, just, just keep putting one foot in front of the other, and hope maybe this will go away, maybe it won't. But it just kept growing and growing and growing, and this fear was all over, over me the whole time, man. Going through the seal process. Uh, I'm sorry, the case got dismissed. Yes, the whole case got thrown out. From a judge that was retiring, right? From a judge, a super liberal judge that was retiring, which was weird because we thought he was going to throw these guys in for life. Being the fact he's liberal. And, yeah, and it was yeah. his last case. We thought it would be the opposite. But he he wrote a 90-page dissertation about how it was prosecutorial misconduct. Wow. So the guys get off. I never, I, dude, never talk nothing. And, and then... We 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 go. I go down this journey with the seals, and then um, what was it? Two thousand. It was when uh, it, it was when President Biden was vice president um, with Obama. He promised 
the Iraqi president at the time that they were going to drum this case up again and throw those guys in prison for life. He promised him that. Because the Iraqi president was pushing the issue. He wanted justice behind what happened. That and Biden's brother was doing a major cons- construction. Yeah. His brother. So I think, mo- yeah. Money involved. Money Politics. Involved. And doing a construction. S- scratch so, my back, I'll scratch yeah. yours. Yeah, yeah. So they, they, they promised the Iraqi government that they were going to. And that's why this was so vehemently gone after trial after trial, mistrial. Um, Hung jury, all this stuff. They just kept trying it, kept trying it. And they needed, they needed, they desperately needed to know what I did that yeah. day. Yeah. And, and what I, and what happened. They, they wanted, and they wanted to know if I would roll. Yeah. They, 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 and uh, so I kept, I, I kept nothing, right? And then they, they, um, my lawyer said, hey, they're, they're going to give you compulsory immunity. I said, "What does that mean?" Yeah. He says, "Well, you're gonna you need you're gonna go testify." And so when I went and testified, um, they hated me after that. <laughs> I mean, hated me, bro. You didn't fall in line. No, I didn't go along with their story. Yeah, you didn't and, cooperate. And other guys did. A bunch of other Blackwater guys did. Uh. I mean, boy, they. I mean, they. 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 They flipped on the. Oh, head. bro, so bad, bro. And, and there was no need to do it. Why would other Blackwater guys do that? It's just they got, they cracked under the pressure. I mean, they cracked you know. under the pressure. Some of them got U.S. Marshal jobs afterwards. I'm not even lying, bro. So there was deals. Police. Under, there was deal behind it. A couple of them were former police officers. Okay. And 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 that's right because not everybody was a Marine. Yeah, stuff like that. So and, and they and so so dudes rolled on each other and, and went along this crazy um, story that we conspired together. And so after hearing my testimony under complete immunity, and I mean, I let it out, exactly what happened. And they were pissed at me. And they said, man, they even told my lawyer, if he testifies like that again, uh, we're going we're gonna to destroy his SEAL career. They were pissed, man. And so I had to make a decision. Was I going to do the wrong thing uh, and, 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 and be like the other guys and collab- and, and cooperate? Yeah. This ludicrous story of we conspired together and, and did all this bad. Or was I just going to stick to my truth, you know? And I was there. And so, man, it was, I knew, I knew my SEAL career was pretty much over uh, the next time I testified. I was in sniper school. Yeah. And so I go testify the same way again. You hear a pin drop in there. And uh, I looked over and there was this FBI agent just staring at me just, Mad. I can remember. I thought, man, they're not supposed to get that mad. They're not supposed to be shaking red and, you know, you know, breaking his pencil, looking at me. You know, they're not supposed to do that. They're, they're, they're like, aren't they supposed to be like kind of blinded by that and just yeah. kind of do the, yeah. no, nah, man, not my experience. And so, I testify the last time. I go to my seal command. I get called in my office, and uh, my commander that I'm like good friends with, he goes. And I'm at the apex of my game yeah. at my SEAL command, man. Sniper, team leader, all this stuff. And made it through all this crazy stuff. And I get called in the command office, and he says, my commander says, Jimmy, you have 10 days left to get out of the Navy. I said, I said, what? I thought it was a joke. And he said, you only got 10 days left to get out of the SEALs. I said, I looked at him, man, with crazy eyes. We've been talking about <laughs> Yeah. I, I looked at him with the same eyes you gave me. Yeah. And you say, man, I'll be in prison, you know? Yeah. When I first met you, I gave him the crazy eyes. I said, man, I said, I ain't going nowhere, bro. Yeah. You know? And I said, you hear me? I ain't going nowhere. And I was dead serious. I I went through hell, bro, to get to in to get to where I was. Yeah. And and mission impossible, bro. Remember finding Nemo? A mission yeah. impossible. I just kept moving one day at a time, one day at a time. Eating it, bro. Eating shit every day. And, and then I and then I make it there, and they're gonna do that, and they just had, they had no idea who they were messing with because I I said I ain't going nowhere. He goes, no, damn it, you're you're. He goes, I guarantee you that you're you're getting kicked out in ten days, Jimmy, one hundred percent. Yeah. And I said, I said, all right, let's let's go, like let's go all out. Ten days came around, and I walked by my commander, still had my trident on. I slapped him in the back while he was talking to this guy. You don't do that. 
You don't touch these guys. <laughs> I slapped him on the back as hard as I could. Not yeah. hard, but I was like, boom. You That's know, firm. And he was like, he was like, oh, you know. And he was like, you don't. That's what Wooden Watson, you know. And I'm like, I said, sir, I'm still here. I'm still here. And, and, and period, periodically, I will go by his office and say, hey, sir, I'm still here. And, and I fought like hell, man. Stay. I lo- yeah, and I had to go through all this stuff. $15,000 of my own money, drain my account, um, um, started representing myself, filing all kinds of complaints, you know, you know, uh, issuing all kinds of investigated things to myself, you know, all these different things. Command, un- un- unlawful command influence is what it was. Yeah. Can't do that. A year goes by, two years goes by, and I'm still fighting him. People are like, Jimmy, you're like a cockroach, man. <laughs> they just won't kill you. Yeah. They just can't kill you. It just ain't going away. No, and I, I just, I, and bro, it was the hardest thing in the world. I, I wanted to give up so bad. I think a lot of people don't understand that. It's like you, you, you think about quitting all the time and still training. Yeah, you know that that don't don't worry about that. You can think about quitting all the time. That's just part of life. Yeah. That's part of your emotions, controlling your 100%, emotions. Hundred percent. Yeah. You you want to quit everything? Like, man, I don't want to be here no more. This is stupid. What am I doing? Yeah. When you really get in the thick of it, but uh, but you got to keep pressing forward, keep moving forward, and eventually I won my case. Oh, okay. Eventually, I stayed in under some crazy, crazy circumstances. circumstances. Yeah. Cra- wow. And then, and then, um, you know, I went and testified again, like the same way I did, in my SEAL uniform. And they they couldn't believe I showed up again in my SEAL uniform. Yeah. Because they 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 thought they buried me. They thought they thought they buried Jimmy, and, and I said I told you I wasn't going to work, and I did it again. And this time. Uh, so it was bad, brother. It was it was a it was a hard hard time in my life. It was harder for the for the for the Blackwater guys. They yeah. they, they they went to prison, man. These these poor dudes, man. All right, everybody. Hood Stocks is sponsored by Kush Stock. All right, October twenty six. Hey, man, the best marijuana festival you will ever go to. Kush Stock. October 26th at Adelanto Stadium. Tap in. You best believe we will be there. Breaking news. The Fed has just lowered rates. If you own a home, now is the time to revisit the financing. And if you want to buy, revisit the approval process. Many of our listeners mistakenly believe the only way to buy a home is to have perfect credit, a large down payment, and then proceed to get into a bidding war on your favorite home. This isn't the case right here. Uh Uh-uh. The team at Prime Equity Mortgage has access to off-market inventory and access to 50-plus banks plus their own bank. Jesus. They have helped thousands of people in our community get their home and even help investors find ugly homes to flip. This is how home flippers buy their homes, all right? Call my dog, Andrew, man, uh, and see what he can do for you and your family, all right? His phone number is 626-825-6565. Looking for some good quality cannabis. I mean, killer quality cannabis. Hip the folks at Killer Kush. They specialize in bringing the best available uh, quality available from OG to exotic. They got it all, baby. Hit them up on IG at Killer Kush underscore underscore four. 20 to find a location. All right, looking for the best criminal defense attorneys in, in the city of Los Angeles. Look no further. Uh-uh. Derek Sherrod is our guy. He could be your guy as well. Sometimes you got to cross that bridge. Sometimes you had a wild weekend. Sometimes you've been incriminated on something you just didn't do, man. And you got to have the best on the team, man. That's Doug Sherrod. And you can reach our criminal defense attorney, Doug Sherrod, at kingkonglawyer.com. kingkonglawyer.com. Orange County, stand up. Go to Phenom is a lifestyle brand that's dedicated to supporting and inspiring individuals who are determined to achieve their dreams. We believe that no matter where you come from and what you've been through with hard work and dedication, anything is possible. Visit gutterphenom.com, gutterphenom.com, and uh, yeah, they're going to take care of you real nice. What the hell happened right here? Oh, yeah, use exclusive code, hoodstocks20, get 20% off. Hey, uh, today's episode is brought to you by Street Polish, the brand that's taking streetwear to the next level. The mixed raw street vibes with a clean, fresh look, so whether you're grinding or hanging out, Street Polished has you looking sharp. Check out their new gear and be a part of the crew where style really matters. Big shout out to Street Polish for sponsoring this episode. And you can find them at streetpolishedbrand.store or on Instagram at street underscore polished. All right, peep game. If you have an annuity or structured settlement, hit up 
your girl, Veronica, with Catalina Structure Funding. She can get you your money when you need it most. Catalina Structure Funding is attorney-owned and operated, so hit up your girl at 818-319-1581. A, we're also sponsored by uh, Graphic Joe. Graphic Joe does all our stickers, man, and so if you'd like to, you know what I mean? You need some stickers. We got you. You know what I mean? We're going to give you our plug, our hookup. All that good shit. Uh, matter of fact, just go to Instagram, graphic at graphicjoe underscore, DM him. Tell him Hoodstock sent you, and he going to take good care of you. And uh, we will be, uh, yeah, let's get back to this episode. Bye-bye. Bro, it's stuffy out here, man. This climate is different in California. Yeah, no, it is. Especially Crazy, this, yeah, bro. the weather's a little funky, too, right now. So you're, you're, you show up to court in your SEALs uniform, and... FBI is tripping that you're still with the seals. Yeah, I mean, how how how, bro? How intimidating is it to be under the you know like the microscope of the FBI, bro? And you, you you've been in war, man. You've been in firefight. I mean, you've been through the fucking what do they call the suck or something like that? Yeah, the suck. You know, you've been through it, brother. I mean, and now you got FBI. Like, do those dudes were they intimidating you? I mean. How did you feel? Yeah, it's, it's all intimidation, man. Uh, you know, every Christmas, every Christmas day, I got another really bad letter. Like Christmas Day. From FBI. Like, is that coincidence, man? Mm. So they do it like that, huh? Like, I, I, got a, I, I got a letter of intent to indict me on 17 counts of violence with a machine gun and, and manslaughter Yeah. on Christmas Day. And... I had to travel up to to Washington D.C. DC. And man, when you when all you ever wanted to do was serve your country, brother, like serve your country, like legit, like like you know, like like give back, like protect, like you know, do something in some kind of capacity to give back. And that's all you want to do. And then you're painted in the exact opposite of who you really know who you are inside. So you want to go save people? You're a monster now. That's that's what they look at you like. You're a freaking monster. And uh, and so traveling to D.C. over and over and over for this. Traveling to D.C. after I got that letter of intent to indict. Um, and and having that loom over me, man. And I was about to get arrested. I was about to have to turn myself in. And then they decided not to at the last moment. Long story short. Yeah. Uh, man. And then, and then I just go home. And I'm like, am I going to get arrested when I go home to Texas now? Like... It's never it never ends. You're always looking over your shoulder, and um, Are, is it FBI the scariest people to have after you? I, I oh, man, yeah. I mean, other than the mob or something, you know. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, I mean, because 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 they know they know everything about you, you know. How paranoid were you back then? Super paranoid. Like I, I phone mean, calls, everything. Like I'll tell you what made me more more paranoid, and I, I don't want to jump too too hot, too far ahead. Okay, but with with McAfee. When when I got calls from the FBI, okay. On the second, I mean, who you know who has, you know, two different run-ins with the FBI on two different yeah. occasions. Yeah, it's weird, right? Uh huh. It's weird. Hundred percent. Yeah, it's weird. And so, do you, I want to ask? I want to ask you this question. Do you feel like, like obviously, those brothers that were involved in that firefight that ended up going getting convicted, going to prison until Trump pardoned them? Um, I mean, they got done dirty. You'd say they got done dirty, man. Yeah, real dirty. Is is the, and when and when they have to go to prison, they go to a certain prison. What is it, Guantanamo Bay or something like that? No, 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 no. It, this is the this is the first time I know of that they're civilians. So it's a federal, you know, lockdown. Uh, high, 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 I think it's, it ain't no joke. Yeah, so they're in there with the regular, regular dudes. Yeah, you know the, the gangsters. It's the, not a it's the mobsters. Not, yeah, yeah. It ain't no, you know, it's the military. Guant uh, the military is like Leavenworth and stuff. Okay. But this is like, I mean, they had to, they had to gather these nineteen twenties old mob, old, old uh, mobster violence with a machine gun. They had to bring that back up uh, to charge these guys. They didn't know what to charge them with. So it was violence with a machine gun. It's an old mobsters, like 1920s law they brought up for the first time in years. And that's what they got these guys. Like violence with a Tommy machine gun. Yeah. Like, like that kind of stuff. Wow. Yeah. And, and they were successful at it. 
there was a driving force behind all that to convict these guys, and we talked a little bit about it, right? You know? Yeah, man. When 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 they told me that I was getting kicked out of the Navy, I, I, I said, "Who's this coming from?" And they said, "It's coming." My lawyer said, "It's coming all the way from the top, Jimmy." Yeah. Like all the way. And we're talking I'm about like, White House top, right? I think that's what he was alluding to. Yeah. Even beyond the Navy, because because you think about it. Uh, they they wanted to discredit anybody that was going to get in their way. As we can see right now, what's going on in the in the world, you know, they're going to try to ass- assassinate your character. If they can't do that successfully, it's they're gonna they're gonna you know prison or something crazy legal. And if they can't do that, they try to kill you, try to assassinate you, and you know if they're not successful with that, then then their little money laundering schemes over, you know. There's a lot of like you know, talk like it's a lower level, obviously, but just the uh, culture. Uh, what do you call it? Cancellation culture they have now. Yeah, cancel culture. Cancel yeah. culture, bro. Yeah. And there's a lot of like you know, just people that are now getting getting convicted of stuff that happened like twenty uh, some years ago. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that has any correlation with each other, but um, what do you mean get, get, getting uh? Get in trouble now for what? Yeah, just like I mean, a lot of a lot of different actors, movie stars. Yeah, uh, yeah, like Diddy and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but even before Diddy, Diddy's. You know, I think that's just a, it's a different type of. That's a different level right yeah, there. Yeah, but just in general, you know, um, apologies about that. I just sometimes I get a little ADHD and scattered brain. And no, I, I, no I, I feel you. No, it's true though. It's true. Um, There's a big. It's a big cancel culture right now. Okay, so. The guys that went to prison, man. The, how long did they they stay in prison? Seven years or something? You said. I think they did seven years, man. Seven years, and they were just in general population, or maybe, yeah. you know, yeah, in regular federal prison yeah, with yeah. all the other guys. Yeah. Hmm. That's got to be tough on them and their families. Super but, tough on them, man. Yeah. I mean, I talked to one of them, and he was like, "Yeah, there's riots all the time. It's crazy." You know, talked to a couple of them, and they, man, they just they went through hell, bro. I mean. Just like anybody, when you when when you go to prison for a, for a, a stretch like that, you know, the, the, and then Trump parted them off the top. Trump, yeah, parted them straight up, boom, 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 and and that was obviously in effect from people that know Trump, to connect with Trump, advocating for these guys. I think so. I I, I think there's some. Um, I I think you know it was a it was a big push for these guys. Yeah, I think a lot of. I mean, when when all you see is a bunch of burning cars on TV, and you hear seventeen civilians got killed, um, you automatically just assume all of us are murderers. I mean, it's just a, it's just, I mean, everybody for years just thought, man, there's just a bunch of murders. But think about that logically, like how how could there be so many psychopaths on one team? Hundred percent. And but and you know and, and you said the CNN was there and CNN is more of like a liberal right yeah a platform it was an agenda yeah you had and, senator and we all know we only know what they show us are because we're not there yeah it's highly highly unlikely that a team is going to go in and just execute blast the whole place to smithereens yeah for zero reason it's hard. like you can't you can't coordinate that. Because it's not it's not natural. It's it's an unbelievably unnatural to. Well, it's like doing a drive by. Yeah. Know? Like you have to like you have to collaborate. You have to coordinate. You have to talk about it a long time. When was all this going on? And, and, and then and then execute that. Yeah. Out out, in the, out at the right time and have everybody on board just smoke and smoke and smoke it. It's like, I mean, for what? There's there's no benefit to that whatsoever. And there's not this payback retribution. They would like to paint that. You know, like the movie Platoon, where there was a division in the platoon. Yeah. And one's evil, and one's bad, and one's good, and one's trying to stop the evil from doing it. Like the Eddie Gallagher story and all this sissy stuff going on. No, it's just not reality. Guys get scared when, when, when the legal team comes in, and they start rolling on each other to save their ass, what's left of it. And they're they're willing to compromise their integrity, compromise their values, everything, and just roll and say and say, yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. I did, yeah, that guy didn't have a weapon, or this this didn't happen, this happened, just to, just so they don't get in trouble. 
you know, whatever it takes. Meanwhile, the homeboys are going to prison, man, you know. If it wasn't for Trump, man, those dudes would still be in prison, huh? If it wasn't for Trump, bro, um, they they would they'd be serving mandatory thirty year sentence. Wow. Off the off the bat. And I think the judge said, I wish I could have gave him more or something crazy. <laughs> like no, no, he no, he said, This breaks my heart to do this, but I'm giving you mandatory thirty years. Well, must not have broke your heart that much. Yeah. You know, yeah. Why would you even uh, express it's totally, that? Totally, totally desensitized. Yeah. Why would you even express that while handing thirty it, years? It's totally desensitized to the reality of what thirty years actually is. Hundred percent. I mean, nobody can. I I can't fathom that. I went to the feds. I went to uh, FMC when I was arrested after being on the run. Yeah. For like five days, bro. And this is with John uh, when you're running with yeah. John. Yeah. For like five days, and 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 then they transferred me to house arrest when I won my my. Um, uh, case to not go shift upstate New York pending trial. But man, five days, bro, I was ready to get out of feds, man. <laughs> five <laughs> days, bro. And I can't imagine. I can't imagine, you know? Yeah. It's like doing long deployments in a cage. It's it's nuts. Yeah, for sure. It can, uh, and it, what it does too is it breaks some individuals too. But um, <clears throat> I'm Navy SEAL, so I read books about that, that are written by Navy SEALs, yeah, yeah. Um, and I read uh, books that people quote or they talk about, like there's something called, Navy SEALs call it box breathing, you know, to regulate the heartbeat, you know, the breathe in, the breathe out, the four seconds. Yeah, um, yeah. And anyway, so I'm, I am just like, ah, I'm a fucking... I'm a fanboy of the Navy SEALs, bro. I hate to say it like that, but I just like, I always want to, uh, you know, because they, they the cream of the crop, bro. You know, what they do and how to get into it. I mean, so when you got into the Navy SEALs, can you share some of the things that you had to get past or pass to become a Navy SEAL that some people aren't able to, you know, do and which separates the ones that make it into the Navy SEALs and the ones that don't? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's it's a it's a massive endurance test. You know, you're freezing all the time. You're chafed up. You know, you know. Um, you're tired, man. I mean, obviously, you're just beat all the time. You never stop running. You run hundreds of miles. You never stop running. Like even to go to even to go to eat to the chow hall, you're you're running right, and then. And then this is it's it's accumulating uh, all this pain like compounding interest and then you know you're you're getting fractures you're getting injured uh, and then and then you go you, that leads you into hell week and you start with like 250 rough and tough guys that and you're all like buddies saying there's nobody in here that's gonna quit like if anybody quits it's gonna be me because these guys are stronger than me right yeah and then three weeks into it you start hell week with maybe a hundred guys. So like 150 dudes drop before Hell Week. I mean, you got, like I don't care how much trash talkings out there on on these other YouTubes. There's there's some real haters of seals and stuff. But you cannot, you can say all you want, but you just can't deny the the stats, the data. Um, I mean, you take 250 guys, and now you're down to 100 guys starting Hell Week three weeks later. Yeah, something happened in that three weeks. And everybody was die hard, by the way. Yeah. And that's taken from like 500 die hard guys. So everybody is like hardcore die hard that they're not going to quit. Something happened in three weeks to spirits, make you say. Spirits got broken. Your spirits game. Your spirits are broken. Yeah. And uh, and that's one of the reasons why why guys quit is, is they're capable, but they're like, dude, I don't want to do this as a job. And they start to realize that this is the lifestyle of a SEAL. It's not just the train. It's not just two years. It's like you're not even considered a seal until you've done like six years, right? So, like, like you're you're in it to win it, and it's a lifestyle. You embrace the suck every day, and it only gets worse. The only easy day was yesterday, right? We say in the seals, and so, um, um, uh, you you you, you go into hell week, and you know hell week is just absolutely brutal, right? And and then, um, and I would say the main the main thing that has to happen with each and every guy. Every guy that has to go through this is a a switch has to be flipped in in their head at some point, or they will not be able to go on. They take you to the absolute point of exhaustion, and then at some point, 
at some point while you're talking to your shoes and mumbling and fumbling around and you're about to quit, something has to go off. But once that flip is switched, bro, <laughs> you turn into an, like on another level, like that flow state. Like you don't care anymore about broken bones or fractures or you don't care about nothing, bro. And that's that's what had to happen with me. But to get to that point where that with that switch, you got to snap, huh? You can do so much more. Every I, I believe every man can do so so much more than what they believe their maximum is. Well, the Navy SEALs say that there's a they. Uh, well, this is what I'm reading, and I got a Navy SEAL right here, right? Um, but I read that the Navy SEALs have a forty percent rule. You know what I mean? Uh, when you feel like you're at your max, you're only at forty percent. You have sixty yeah. percent left. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. When you're at your absolute, just done. You can't got. You cannot go one more step. You're halfway. Yeah, you're halfway. You got. You got about half more. And it's true too. How many times you be at the gym and you can be bench pressing, bro? And be like, and you don't have someone. You don't. You're not working out with somebody. So you know you're in your head. You're just like, ah, oh, that's good right there. But really, you can bust out. Yeah. You can push yourself about the same amount you just did more. Yeah. Big time. But so it's all up here, right? You know. Yeah, it's 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 really mindset, you know. It's all about your. It's all in the mind, man. And and I can remember, you know, it was taking a while for that that switch to flip. And I and I heard about this with other guys. Yeah, like when's that gonna flip? You know, because if it don't flip soon, I'm I'm done. Yeah, I'm gonna kill over. And and so, about halfway through Hell Week is, um, I remember, I uh, was just done, you know, and I, and like half the class was quitting. Like forty dudes quit. Forty bad motherfuckers in one night. Yeah, in one. It was so cold, man. People are just. That's why I love it when I love it. I secretly love it when I hear guys bagging on SEAL training. So it's not that hard. It's like, dude, you just have no clue in your little mind how how cold it is and how bad it is. And um, I wouldn't go do it again. You know what I mean, and so so that that switch had to flip in my mind, and, and I remember I was so cold, man, that one night. All these dudes are quitting, and everything in my body was telling me to quit. Yeah. It was I I could not find one reason to to continue on, and yeah. and I remember the instructor came up to me and kicked the the tube that I was sitting on, this black boat that I was sitting on, and we're about to go back out in the crushing crashing waves at night. It was so cold. I was sitting there just like, oh, I couldn't really, you know, you, you get so cold, your hips are hurting, your everything's just hurt all the time. You know, you're grinding your teeth. And that instructor came over and kicked the tube. And he said, hey, Watson, he said, you going to quit too with your class? You going to join your class and quit? And I looked up and I almost got up and said, yeah, screw this. <laughs> and because and I and I looked up and I seen these guys and they were they were like, they were getting these hot, warm wool blankets out of the oven and wrapping around them in these hot beanies, in this hot soup, in this chow, in, in, in this coffee. And they were going and sitting there, and, and they were going to go take a, a, a three-hour hot shower and then sleep for like two, three days. I don't know, just sleep forever. I, and I just saw all this happening, and this was all going through my mind as this instructor was waiting for my response. And I remember looking up right past my instructor, and I, I could see my room. At, at, at night, I could see my room light on in the barracks, and I thought, you know, I could I could stop right now. I could get the hot bowl of soup. I could get the coffee. I could get the warm blanket. I could get a shower. I could sleep for two, three days, but then I had to wake up. Yes. And when I woke up, I'd be in that room, and everything that I, everything that I worked for, everything would be gone. Yes, Just sir. Like that. And so many guys quit, and that's when that switch in my mind flip and i said i no i ain't going nowhere again you know yeah. i ain't going nowhere and and so the search said damn you hard brother they like that stuff they're like okay we'll see we'll see we'll see and yeah. man we went back out in those waves and it was brutal but after that i was laughing after that, i didn't care about nothing <laughs> and my foot was broke bro my foot was just pop like pop like yeah. a broomstick my foot was done and when he came officially 5150, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> people didn't care. Right? Like, yeah. Buy it. yeah, yeah, you didn't care about nothing. Yeah. And and that was a great feeling. Yeah. This doesn't mean it wasn't hard at, at many times. Yeah. Because then you got third phase and you're just so depressed, bro. It's depressing, man. What is one of the hardest things they do? Like, you sometimes you, you, you see them or you hear, I mean, it's all hearsay, right? Um, lock you in a box. 
make you. Uh, I mean, what's 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 one of the craziest things that you have to endure? Um. I don't know, just the grind. The grind of... The of, nonstop grind? The nonstop relentless. grind. Relentless. And just, 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 just relentless cold okay. all the time. So swimming in the ocean. How, how? I mean, do you have to be able to swim a certain distance in the ocean? Yeah, yeah, it depends. Underwater, you know, you're, you're on the drag, you're kicking your ass off. You're like, it's like the biggest cardio ever. You're like, you're just kicking as hard as you can. Your legs are burning. And for four hours straight, four hours. It's like getting on a treadmill. Yeah. Or a cardio machine for four hours as hard as you can go. You know, that's like yeah. one dive in one night. And then um you're just kicking your ass off. Um and and, and then and then uh ocean swims, you know, you're 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 always just putting out max exertion. You're always maxing out on everything, you know. So what would you suggest for me? I'm gonna ask you for some advice. So I got a little thing, man. You know, just being uh, locked up in a cage uh, for X amount of years. Um, I need to get on an airplane because my, my family want to go on vacations, and I've had a hard time getting on an airplane, even to this day. You know, what I, mean? I, I know I can, bro. I will, but um, but I always feel like I want to have a parachute because anywhere that I go, I always look for uh, my exit, my nearest exit, my yeah. nearest. Uh, you know what I mean? Anywhere I go, bro, I look for that. Um, um, so, but I feel like, so I feel like in an airplane that, you know what I mean? Um, and then I'm afraid of heights too, man. Yeah. I've done some crazy shit in my life, but I'm not a big fan of heights. Um, man, I, here's, here's what I would say. I would say visualize yourself going in, going in that airplane yes, and, sir. and think about the worst case scenario and think, okay, this thing ain't going to wreck. It's not going to. The chances of it wrecking are, are super slim, right? And so, and it's like it's like my my diet, my jump instructor once said, Jimmy, don't worry about nothing because you know your reserve is going to go off. Now, is it a hundred percent? You know that you're, you talk about the parachute, the, the reserve. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you know, don't worry about your because you have a main parachute, then you have the reserve. And I said, it's, how can you, I said, how can you be so confident? And he was like, well, you just got to be that confident in your gear that no matter what, you know, a hundred percent that reserve is going to go. Yeah. So don't worry about your main, you know, if, he, if something happens, malfunction. And I'd say the same thing. With yeah. The, I say that in the visualization, the visualization. And then that box breathing is so big, man. Yeah. Sometimes I just stop in the middle of the day and I four seconds in. Yeah. Four second hold. That's what they say. It four is, second yeah. out. I mean, that's what I read. Yeah, yeah. Box, box, four second, four second. Yeah. And that really helps, man. It may sound weird. Yeah. But when you start doing it, man, you get in that flow state. You get in that, that good vibes, you know. 100%. Calm down, you know. And so you you've obviously you you jumped out of airplanes, done all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you have to do that to get to your destination through the ocean. Yep. I mean that's what Navy SEALs do, right? Yeah, sea, air, land. You know, it's just a means. It's just a means to get to the to the mission. You know, it, whether that's underwater or or jumping jumping in or through on a helicopter or uh, on top of a gasoline platform, fast roping in or a ship or a VBSS, visit board search and seizure, where, where you're Diving in on a Drager and then coming up and and taking the ship down from from the bottom up, or hooking climbing, you know. So, kind of want to jump ahead a little bit. How did you meet uh, John McAfee? Man, I retired out of the teams. Eventually, got out and uh, didn't know what I was going to do. Did some did some anti uh, human trafficking um, rescues with Saved in America in San Diego County. Was that like mercenary work? No, no, a human trafficking, uh, like like anti-human trafficking, like rescuing kids and stuff. Okay, in, in San Diego County. In San Diego County, okay. but it was it wasn't that sexy again. It was. Is that, is, is, I'm sorry, brother, but is that is that a like a huge thing that's happening? Because they had that one movie that came out. Was that movie? Uh... It's an 800 million dollar industry a year in San Diego County. What are they doing? They kidnap him every kids single or? every single house that we went up to, there was like Johns rolling out the front and back with their pants off, just like a movie. It was like something out. You might as well have Hollywood there filming this and it'd be a movie. Like a guy, big old big old big dude, you know, fat dude running out of the house with his pants around his ankles, like trying to get away, you know? And he and okay, but he was in the house because it's a yeah. prostitution ring. It's a prostitution and it's ring. An it's, underage? It's a underage. It's a house. Yeah, yeah. And it's underage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe 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 four girls uh, or five girls would be in there in 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 from, you know, 
13, 14, 17 years old. Maybe, maybe some, maybe some older girls. And the, are they? So it's a, it's a human trafficking ring, but they are there at their own free will. No, what happens is like, okay, like, like what, what girl, you know, what next door neighbor girl doesn't, doesn't like, you know, I, I'm pissed at you, dad, and, and, and runs away for five minutes. You know, um, they say that the process is that, uh, you know, homeless guy sees a girl, he calls up one of his contacts or one of his plugs or whatever, and, you know, gets a bag for reporting that, and then they can pick her up. And and these girls are moved across state lines within 48 hours. And so they try to move them across state lines and move them around. Uh, because if they can do that, man, they're pretty successful because they got that drug. They, they got that invisible leash, those drugs, um, to uh, control them. Gotcha. And so when we would roll up, these girls are not, like, running out of the house all happy. They hate you, man. I remember one girl was eating an orange, um, eating, the, eating the orange peel, and, and spitting out the the fruit like, the hell, what, what the heck at us, you know? And I'm like, dang man, we're here to rescue you. But man, I as I got out of that, and then so John, so basically my boy T Calf, he he said, hey Jimmy, you want you wanna you wanna work for John McAfee? 